best we can do on my body. That's why I said nothing. All right. You're not going to say a lot. Ready? All right, we here at day two, you know, this is the the last day uh, for the cats out on TV land. When I get this joint, day one was off the chain. Everybody can attest to it. Uh, my mother tore it down. Black Dot really tore it down. And we're going to continue today. And it's actually an honor to be up here uh, introing this next brother. Um, the first time I seen him, him and Black Dot was on the Five Bloodlines of Hip Hop. Him, Brother Rich, and I was like, man, who is this big head dude, you know what I'm saying? Who is this big head dude with all, the, with all of this fancy wordplay? Nah, I'm just bugging. Like, he actually really, really tore it down and really went in. And, like, I could attest. I ain't never looked at hip hop the same since. Since the Five Blood Lines of Hip Hop, you really had to go back and really do the knowledge because, you know, we look at things sometimes from, you know, a very linear perspective because of the indoctrination we've been dealing with. So somebody comes and actually pushes the envelope. One of my favorite phrases from this brother is, challenge the text. I never heard that from no place else. Everybody else just goes in and gets their work done. But he actually challenges the text, and that's what he enables you to do through this uh, sacred art. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and give a strong black hand to A. a. Rashid. Talking about my big head, right? Right, right? Funny guy. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here in uh, Germany with the human family of my brothers and sisters. And I am, I am enjoying myself. Germany is a beautiful place. It's very clean because, and I see it's because the people have a national spirit. Something missing in the States. In the States, it's an amalgamation of so many various people from all over the world, but the people who are indigenous to the <coughs> land in the States are under the deepest level of mind control ever that the world has ever seen. They are under the impression, the large majority of them, that they came to the land in a slave ship when the reality is that we have always been in North America Central and South America as an indigenous people operating within the confines of what it is to be a civilized people so when I come here I see it's very significant that this country and the people have a national spirit something which is missing so much back at home. So uh, I want to also say thank you to the brothers and sisters who are at home, the authentic loyalists who care not about the cult of personality, who don't care about uh, the private life of the speakers, who are not gossiping, who are not trying to, as agent provocateurs, destroy what we have back home. The real people, I thank you very much for validating the message and allowing it to be able to come across seas and be here and make <coughs> manifest in the form of us being here with Brother Curtis Gilead and his family. Okay, so the title, I had changed the title of this lecture. At first I wanted to make the lecture did we have another light on this is it okay i wanted the title of the lecture uh i wanted to per pertain it to specifically uh kabbalah as it is from the german perspective however i said you know what i don't think i should come to germany to speak about germany because the people in Germany might know a whole lot about Germany and they don't want to hear about Germany. 
right? At least from the perspective that I am presenting. The next presenter is the one who is going to rectify and clarify all things pertaining to Germany in reference to its role in the life of the indigenous folks on the planet, okay? And that's Brother True Master. So I said, I am going to speak about some facets of Freemasonry that I have been putting into my lectures piece by piece, trying to formulate a manner for the brothers who are not the exoteric Freemasons who eat, eat uh, pig fat and ribs and have parties and do raffles. I'm talking about, and, and our Christians, I'm talking about the Freemasons who are constantly at ISIS trying to remove her veil, trying to see what's, what's going on. The ones who are always trying to find the underlying meanings of their craft. So I am going to speak about some precursory elements of it and I will tell you that the true meaning and the true secrets of Freemasonry, there are no secrets. Well, let's start by saying this, that there's no such thing as a secret period. If one and all is one, then we all share the same Akashic record. If one of you ail, we all ail. My through line to find the truth, I use Kabbalah. What is it? Kabbalah means simply to receive. If we were to go to Israel and go to a store and buy a, uh, a soda and come outside, they give us receipt and on the receipt it would say in Hebrew, Kabbalah. It just simply means to receive. As it relates to a spiritual system, it corresponds with your ability to assimilate and receive truths. Truths which are not apparent to the two eyes. Right? Those underlying truths which lie within the psyche. That is where the sanctum sectorum or the sacred place where all things come out and open. Now, in this aeon of time in which we're in presently, what is occurring is the truth is now no longer a thing of fiction. The truth now is an organic entity all of all in and of itself. The truth is a declaration solely of the person in the vantage point. The person speaks a truth into existence and it doesn't even make a difference as to what you're saying. You can say anything you want to say in this aeon as we approach the galactic center and anything that you say will come into being. When Brother Curtis's mother was up here yesterday and she was speaking about prayer from my esoteric understanding of what prayer is I know she wasn't talking about praying to you no know, anthropomorphic expression of what we have been taught God and is she's speaking to source because she knows source channels itself through its 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 slices of itself we are all a slice of the grand source. So you have a connection. You can utilize it. So now as we approach this aeon, you and I must be very mindful of what we say, what we think, and the anchors of thinking and word. Primarily in that as we approach the galactic center, our sun will begin to channel to us everything out of the cosmic mother's womb. Out of cosmic womb comes all the gifts and benefits of whatever you need in this world. If we take a close look and observe nature, nature needs nothing. We are the only thing that has the word need in our paradigm. Like a bird does not have need <laughs> right animals so simple the ones we think we are so far beyond in advance have no concept of need we are the only ones who have codified in our language limitation we put in our language limitation for the simple fact that we 
presently don't have or we actually do but we don't share the unified field of consciousness as we should all of humanity because we don't share the same myth okay so what is myth what is myth anyone can anyone tell me what a myth is what does myth mean to you I don't know the actual definition or anything, but to me, it's like a, um, it's a story not to be taken literally, but if you read between the lines, you'll learn the actual truth. Well, that, that, <clears throat> well, any answer rendered today, and this is interactive when we speak, any answer is the right answer. Even if it's off, the utterance of it, and when we take in consideration what is time and the fact that there is no such thing as the past and the future. The only thing that exists is the now. What you say now is your best part, and that's your understanding. So everything that you said segues to it. Anyone else? I would like to hear from others. What is a myth? <coughs> um, something that's a, a story or, or a thought or something that's... Um, passed on or known, but is not defined or 100% defined as 100% true uh, by whatever source of, uh, of, of, of someone saying, okay, this, this is validated or that's validated. This is Right. Right. Now, a myth, have you ever asked someone how to, uh, for instance, Without you showing me, can you tell me how to operate a car, right? Mm -hmm. And when the person sits there and they tell you how to operate a car, actually without you and them being behind the wheel, they are expressing to you a whole visual context for your psychology to remember in order for you to get into the actual vehicle and be able to operate it. A myth is the instruction for soul to participate in the physical world. All world's myths, Greek, Kemetic, from Mali, Dogon, Voodoo, wherever you're at, these myths are psychological tools which aid your mind to self-actualize itself. You were born knowing everything and then you soon forgot. When you were born, you knew how to swim, you knew everything, and then you forgot. The last thing you knew how to do is how to eat, sleep, and shit. Those are the last things you remember. Everything else cosmic, you forgot. But now, as you experience matter and you walk the, the walk of the protagonist, like in every story, the hero, that's you that they're speaking about, right? Walking the myth, walking it, you begin to actualize who you are, your role, you begin to have an identity. You begin to be strong, you begin to be firm, and then now you learn how to slay those dragons and those demons around you who attempt to undermine your progress and what you attempt to do. See? So now, what Freemasonry has offered humanity is a, a, Sneak peek, actually when I say, well, let me rephrase what I just said. What Freemasonry offers the Western psychology, right? Western psychology, and when I say Western psychology, I'm speaking about post-Prussian education, everything that has been taught the world, how to think from a Eurocentric perspective is the Western mind. Now, the Western mind requires a spiritual system, right? So now, what is the spiritual system, the overwhelming one, the one that hovers above all? The one that hovers above all Western systems of spirituality it is Judaism. By proxy, if you are a Christian, you are a Jew. Because Jesus was what? In your mythology, he was what? An extension from the line of what? David, Judah, is a Jew, right? Muslims, the Quran, 
doesn't even introduce any new prophets except for Muhammad. All the other prophets exist in all the other books, right? By proxy, it is Judaic in its essence, right? So now, there are four major religions in the Western world. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Freemasonry. Freemasonry, however, is an amalgamation of the three that I just said before. Islam is the ritual. The book resides in Judaism. My brothers who are initiates understand and know if you've ever been to a grand session or you, when you were circumambulating in your ritual, you know that is Christian. I don't care what nobody say. That's Christian. Okay? So Freemasonry is the four, fourth pillar which encompasses all of the other elements. But the thing about Freemasonry is that it calls God the grand architect of the universe, thus allowing you, the initiate, an ability to begin to now see God as an actual hands-on fixer and builder of the physical world. Now what happens is in this psychology and in this mythology, what happens is you begin to imbue within yourself, you begin to learn and understand that you are actually one of his workers. So while you're down here, you're taking everything that's imperfect and you're breaking off all of the superfluous edges, making things right, making things plain, clean, see, right? So now, psychology is the very foundation of all of existence. Without it, you can't function. You need a fundamental system, a functioning system in which to think, yes? Okay, and that thinking process is, is uh, considered psychology. So now what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna go into the presentation which is visual, and we're going to go through some of the slides. Now I use this picture for a specific reason. Who has ever seen the movie, uh, what was that movie with, was it the Red Dragon? Yeah. With Hannibal? Yeah. Yeah. Now, what was, wasn't that the movie where the guy ate the painting? Yes. That was a William Blake painting. William Blake was a Kabbalist. This uh, picture in, in, in particular is by William Blake, and this one is, I think it's called The Ancient of Days. And what it is, is a Kabbalistic representation of divine masculine intent. Now, as a creature of his time, the uh, gentleman has depicted the Ancient of Days as someone who appears to be himself, which is, if you go to China, Jesus is Chinese. You go to Dominican Republic, you can't tell nobody in Dominican Republic that Jesus ain't no goddamn Dominican. You understand what I'm saying? So you look up according to the cultures of where you're at. Now, the... Uh, now I'll do this down. Yep. Now... The origins of Freemasonry are buried in a shallow grave of ancient symbolic psychology and myth. Very interesting. Does anyone know what this uh, depiction is? What this defines, this depiction? It's a what? Coffin. It's a coffin. And at the head of the coffin, what do we see? We see what? Well, there's a star here. But we see this here, what is this? A tree, okay? So now, it's actually a plant, and the plant in which it is, is it's called an acacia plant. The sprig of acacia. Right, the sprig of acacia. Now, the sprig of acacia was placed at the head of the master builder's grave in an attempt for those who buried him to be able to find him. Now, I, utilizing Kabbalah as my through line to understand almost anything that I deal with, when I embossed Kabbalah on top of Freemasonry, I found that Freemasonry is nothing but Kabbalah. Kabbalah is, in a sense, the fourth religion out of the three Western religions in shrouded within the rituals and the symbols of Freemasonry. 
So now when I went to go look at what is the Hebrew equivalent of the word acacia, I found that the word acacia equals the number 314. Now, the number 314 is very significant in that the number 314 symbolizes what? All of us have went to school, right? We all know math, right? Who remembers uh, how to find the circumference of a circle? Oh, pi, right? Do we got to brush up on our algebra and stuff like that? Okay, so now you remember the other form of pi, the irrational form, was 22 over 7, right? So now, when I saw that the Hebrew cognate, right, for the Hebrew word for the sprig of acacia or acacia was, it's called shita, right? I said, well, let's look at the root of the word shita from a phenological root. The term means from shut, we get the word soot, we get set, we get sithro. Who have ever heard of sithro in the Bible when they talk about sithro? Well, sithro is that which is hidden or that which is in, encased in the darkness. So what I like to do is when I speak, I like to challenge language as the brother says, go into it, look at the language and let the book tell us what the ancients were saying. Don't let Jimmy swagger and the preacher on Sunday tell you what the text is saying. You go into the text yourself, word for word. And when I say word for word, each letter in the Hebrew Bible is an entire word. Three words can be a three letters in Hebrew can be an entire sentence. Now, because it's a language based in the concept, the mind, the cosmic mind of nature. Nature never takes the long route to get to her point. She always goes straight to the point. So she don't need a lot of words to explain herself. Know what I'm saying? Now, she don't need a, eight, a, a dictionary with 800,000 words in it to express one reality. So now, the, I, I, I went to look for some quotes pertaining to myths and I found this one to be very significant. It says, we can keep from a child all knowledge of earlier myth, but we cannot take from him the need for mythology. So what is occurring now is that in this realm of indoctrination, people are being born with their myths already made for them. And many of us are operating with, within these myths and we are giving them truth. We are operating within the truth of that. Like, it is a myth that if you have a gun and you wear the color blue and a badge that I could shoot you, that they could shoot you. That's a myth that you accepted. You understand? It's a myth every time you go into the courtroom and they tell you to stand up, the honorable so-and-so is now, now presiding. That is a mythology that you are participating in. You think that he, because he wears a black robe and sitting up high, right? Be in front of, in God we trust. I don't know what they say in the States. I don't know how the, uh, or here in the States, they, in God we trust behind the judge, right? And then you have to honor him. That's a myth, right? Myth, and this is from the, uh, g a gentleman Carl Gustav Jung, the founder of analytical psychology. Jung is also the one who uh, introduced us into the, uh, to the realm of archetypes, the Western world into the realm of archetypes and how significant archetypes are for the mind of the whole world. Do you know that one symbol can connect us all together? And, one, and, that one, and that one symbol that has been the most pervasive means to unify everybody in this last few, you know, aeon has been 9-11. 9-11 means the same thing to everybody on the planet. I have personally felt a difference in the, vibra in the vibration of the planet and how you interact with human beings on the planet post 9-11. It was a whole different look before that. In a sense, things have calmed down, but people have dumbed down. 
in a sense, you know. Now, another psychologist and uh, Dr. Amos Wilson, he says, Eurocentric history as mythology creates historical amnesia in Africans. Now, this is very significant when reality exists within and only in the minds of, its, of the world's indigenous people. The world's indigenous people are the ones who give validation and credence to all other people on the planet. To put your, your reality into the realm of formation, you must get it past us. If we accept it, look at what we did to Christianity. We took Christianity to, uh, to new heights, right? Yep. We're the ones that's going to make Jesus come down here in the flesh. It's going to be us with them tambourines, them organs, and jumping up and down, right? We did wonders with Islam. We turned Islam, you go to Africa and go check out what Islam is in Africa. Islam is then turned into the most powerful form of magic on Western, the Western coast of Africa. The, it, it is so powerful that when the, uh, the people from the states, the politicians, the, I, I saw a picture with Colin Powell going to Senegal and he had to forget going to see the people in the political arena in the country, he had to go see the sheikhs, the ones who sit down and write magical sigils on paper and sell them to people. There's big magic in West Africa. We did that. We incorporated uh, Islam and, and put our, our, our spin on it and made it into something else. So everything we touch, we turn into gold because we, we, uh, we channel that. Now, mythology has the ability to define the present construct of our organic reality and can be used to manipulate social and political circumstances. Hitler used the theological mythology of social nationalism, which was based from the mythology of the indigenous Germanic tribes of priests known as the Armenian, known most for their runic magic. So if you ever seen the anyone throw stones, you ever seen that? as a means of divination, or bones as a means of divination. Well, the Germans used to do it as well. So how do you think that Hitler was so successful in his endeavors? It was because his endeavors were rooted in spiritual principles. He dealt with spirit over politics. Spirit hovers over the physical world and tells the physical world what to do. The physical world is the slave of spirit. This is why, this is the secret of regeneration. The secret of regeneration is that your organs will do what your mind tells it to do. All you have to do is create the connection between the conscious mind and the organ. And you need a symbol to do it, a connection. And Taoist philosophy, if you have too much anger in your uh, liver, they tell you the symbol is the sound shh. When you go shh, you cool it down, right? Symbols are so significant. Now, here we have very significant personages. We have uh, President Truman decked out in full Masonic regalia. He was, as you can see on his apron, See, this is not a square at the bottom of his apron. He has another emblem. This gentleman was a president, and he was the grand master of all of the grand lodges in Missouri, in the state of Missouri. This is the Duke of Edinburgh in grand session in the lodge in full Masonic regalia. This is like the uber, uber European uh, in the UK. These are like uber European, uh, what do you call it, uh, royalty, dukes and, and all that. They, their spiritual principle, which is most pervasive, the one that is most significant, is in fact Freemasonry. And here we have Truman in a dedication with, accompanied by Freemasons, 
dedicating a statue to George Washington. George Washington, of course, is also in uh, American history a Freemason. Okay? Very significant that Freemasonry was utilized to spread the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the onus of, of Western civilization. Now, the Adam and Eve story is the Western model of human cosmology and is perceived to be real by countless people the world over. This story is a vestige of many ancient mythologies pertaining to biological manipulation of DNA and the Earth's magnetic field as it pertains to light's trajectory traversed towards Earth. Now, Adam and Eve, if you, were go, if you were to go and ask people, do you really believe in Adam and Eve? And people would be like, hell yeah. I had a beginning. We all came from somewhere, didn't we? In, in a sense, we are looking arduously arduously for points of beginning to validate who we are. So in that, we are always willing supplicants for manipulation. Anyone can introduce a new myth to us and we'll just snatch it because we essentially don't have, we don't come equipped with it. They have to be essentially taught to us. The, 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 the goddess in charge of language was Seshet. Seshet used to write. In many, uh, in many cultures, it is the women's job to impart the myth. Now, the ancient priesthood of old connected their own relative world to the physical world by way of symbolic psychology. They used words and numbers to demonstrate their dominion over material existence. Now, we see here, we have a depiction of the kingu, or the serpent kings. You see these are serpents with crowns upon their head, and they're holding uh, a serp uh, two serpents in the middle. Now, this is an ancient symbolic reference to the, the, the spiritual symbolism and the spiritual meaning of the only thing that you have that really uh, 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 acts as the vessel for who you are. The vessel for the soul, the crystal for the soul is, in fact, your DNA. Only 2% of your DNA is actually used for genetic information. The rest of your DNA acts almost like a skeletal structure for your flesh to uphold something. Your DNA is what, uh, what a LCD screen would be to a plasma television. It's a medium by which to house the light, right? In order for the hologram to exist. Everyone has the same uh, 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 essentially helical structure externally of DNA and in that the fact that we all share the same crystalline lattice of the DNA allows us all to communicate that connects us to the biosphere everything in existence plants animals all have DNA so once your DNA is attuned in such a way you can now or, or, or certain circumstances in the environment are created all DNA on the planet is connected, all consciousness is connected. Oh, can we cut that light so I can just get the screen? Which, oh, okay. This one here? Better? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. The ancients depicted the serpent as a symbol of change because the serpent is stellar or sunlight. In the Adam and Eve myth, the serpent uses a ruse of coercion. This ruse symbolizes stellar light's ability to promote genetic polymorphic mutations in DNA, causing it to both change as well as block various mutations depending on the electromagnetic environment of the body. Now, the sunlight that you receive is actually the manufacturer of your holographic body. If you want to know where you come from, if you want to seek your origin, all you must do is look to the source of light. The source of light in particular that we are speaking of is the sun. The sun is known 
every 11 years to send flares down that are so powerful that they can knock out pacemakers. People die, people have heart attacks. All of this in 11 year cycles from the power that the sun brings. Now the sun shoots to our planet plasma as well as other particles which come within the magnetic field of the planet and begin to conform and become organic material. Okay? So the reason why your, your sustenance and the reason why you can live longer if you eat vegetables is because you're having a connection with solar imperative. Okay? So green, when you, when, when they, when they, when they, when in the Quran, when they speak about El Kidr or the green one, they're speaking about the ever living life power or life force inherent within the electromagnetic field of things like chlorophyll, right? And things like uh, 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 alkaline foods. And this is why all things begin at a tree. They always show you that. But they have Adam and Eve at a tree. Right? Now, they, Adam and Eve ain't at Kentucky Fried Chicken for sustenance. They're at a tree. If you were meant to eat Kentucky Fried Chicken, your ass would have came down here with a bucket. Right? <laughs> but you don't have that. You understand? You have the substance in the tree of life to sustain, essentially, the light conduit in which it, there's a resonation of light. Okay? So now... If we look here, I attached a, a DNA strand to the center of this to also promote how the ancients knew that these serpents or these actually, these are like some flying serpents mixed with like animals and all type of stuff to express the spiritual principle of the primal element, the primal aspect of matter. Matter is a beast of its own. We encompass who we are Individually, we encompass spirit world and the physical world. We would be almost like the Minotaur would be in the Sagittarian, would be the beast up top and the physical being down below. So you must be trained in both realms. You must be trained in both realms in order to rise above one. Now, very significant. Everybody told us that how long does it take for light to get to us from the sun? Eight minutes, right? Didn't I, everybody I knew know that? You ever hear that? That it takes the sunlight to get to you eight minutes? Well, science has validated that the sun is 93 million miles away from us. Light travels at what? 186,000 miles. 186, miles, miles per second. Now, from 93 million miles away, with light traveling at 186,000 miles per second, it takes light eight minutes to get to you. Meaning, the light that got to you is kind of old, right? <coughs> so, if that light is the news, then the lights from the old, the, from the far reaches of the galaxy that are coming from far other places or sources, they ain't even get here yet. So you don't even know what's going to happen. Right? Because that's the news. The light comes on the news. So now, I found something very significant in the biblical scripture. And I'm going to share that with you pertaining to those eight minutes of light. Right? Very significant. And then when, when I come out with my brothers, and this is going to be one of the last times, if not the last time I give a lecture. I chose to do it here. In the States, I'm only going to be doing classes and workshops. No more, you know, it's going to be more hands-on and we're going to go right into the book. You know what I'm saying? But I wanted to just leave some things for the people who really get into it and the real science, if you're really into Kabbalah, for the brothers and, and sisters in the UK and everywhere, if you're really into the Kabbalah, the best book on Kabbalah is the Bible. All other books on Kabbalah are this, you know, cookie cuts. They come out of essentially what it is and the only best book that can ever be written on Kabbalah would be the one that you write from your findings. So now the hidden light of Freemasonry is the sun. 
and you the initiate are the temple of Solomon for it is the sun which creates the geometric square which is Solomon's temple by way of solar flares and solar winds referred to as the Kedem Ruach in the text referred to as the Kedem Ruach but how does one harness this hidden light this is a question of the age now when we go to the text very interesting let's go to the text we are in the book of Kings chapter uh, 1 uh, we're in Kings 1 verse 1 chapter 1 verse 6 and it says and it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the, in the month of Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house for the Lord. Now, what, what is this house of the Lord that he's talking about? What is it? All of us got Bibles. I don't know nobody in here that don't got a Bible at home. Don't know nobody that got a Bible. Right? That don't have one. Right? I know they got Bibles out here in Deutsch and every other language. Right? We got this book. We operate within this mythology, but we don't ever go look at to see what it really is. And this is why we can't never get free from the reins of what it intends to lock you down in. <coughs> we sign on to a contract and don't even know the clauses or the particulars in the contract. This is what baffles me with people in general. We will wholeheartedly accept something as long as it got frosting and icing on it and it tastes good or it appeals to the external sensory perception. But no one ever wants to see what is the internal dynamic. Okay? Why was it so significant for them to do that? Why was the amount of years between the building of King Solomon's temple and the Exodus led by mythological Moses so significant that the ancient scribes had to mention it? The secrets rest within the numbers, always. Before you were anything, you were a number. I challenge anybody to refute that. Anybody. I, can't nobody refute that. It's a waste of time to even put that challenge out there. Before you were anything, you were a number. In fact, nothing else in the universe ex exists except for numbers. All we're seeing are morphogenic expressions of numeric potencies. Patterns upon patterns of numbers. Interactions with various numbers. The external vestige of what this number entails is the number one. And you see that in the atom. And then the atom chooses where to put itself. To create more atoms. To create bigger crystallization. You know what I'm saying? To create harnesses and vehicles to encompass and create the space to house the volume of truth. This bottle is nothing without something in it, right? What is it without something in it? Piece of plastic, right? It's garbage. What do you do with it? You throw it away, don't you? So what are we doing with these bodies? This body that you have is a vessel that has within it the ability to house a volume of a particular consciousness. What are they building when they build a temple? And who is the artificer of the temple? The sun is building a temple to accommodate itself within the housing of your flesh. You are so disconnected with your son. You're not connected with your son. You are not connected with your son because you don't eat solar food. Consistently solar food. And you're not wet enough. Meaning you don't drink enough water. <laughs> you don't drink enough water. And water is so very significant. Three-fourths of the planet is water. Water is so very significant for the reception of light. Okay? The mythological Moses, his name means literally his... I'll show you that later. I'll show you that later. So you can know. And I, and I, and I qualify when I say the mythological Moses because there are a lot of Moseses. Right? It's a lot of Moses. Isaac Hayes was Moses. Yeah, tell me about it. 
480 is the Kabbalistic equivalent of the Hebrew word path, which means an opening. So now when our English speakers, when you hear someone say, clear a path for me, it has a Hebrew origin, which, which of course has an origin in Kim, which means opening. Numbers express function and sound is the vehicle of function. When we switch the Hebrew letters, we receive the word thop, which is a hand drum, a musical instrument and as well a vehicle for sound. So now listen, let me say this again, because I want to, I don't want to, this, we're speaking about essentially a lot of concepts that people perhaps never heard of. And I always speak to the future. Some of the stuff that I say in the tapes, like, the stuff that I said in tapes a long time ago, like my first tapes, did not really become relevant to people for a year and a half, sometimes later than that. You gotta, you have to challenge yourself to say that everything that I know right now is a lie. It does not exist, it's not real. And then challenge yourself to begin to become a reality creationist based on your observation of what nature has given you as a guide. Right? So now, numbers express function. Numbers express function and sound is the vehicle of function. Nothing physical can exist not the sound can exist without the physical world. And the physical world is a byproduct of sound. When you have an organ that is ailing, there are means and manners in which you can address the organ by speaking to it. Right? And resonating with it. It's a, when you're saying uh, the disease is the, is the evidence of lack. Right? Disease is the evidence of lack. What is lacking? The only thing that could lack is love. Because that's the only thing that really exists. That's the most powerful uh, 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 force in the universe. In fact, if you do anything in the universe that's not an act of love, then what is it? It's an act of fear. And think about that. If you, everything you do, if you don't do it for the love, you're doing it for fear. Because love is the only constant thing in the universe. Walking to your room, going to use the bathroom, going to eat, all of that can be enshrouded and encompassed into love, right? But when you start contemplating on what if I'm, I might slip and fall, something might happen, boy, they might kill somebody, things are going to happen. Oh, God, I don't want to go in there. I don't want to go outside. I ain't going outside. No. And then what happened? Right? You have magnetically created the circumstance for fear to root itself in your existence. And now all this stuff that you thought that you could never happen is happening. And even the poor babies are inheriting the children are inheriting the fears of the parents. Babies don't even know where they're getting it from. They don't even know why they feel that way. And if you know that certain cultures raise ch children in different ways. Some cultures, they, I showed in my last lecture, I showed they put, put uh, defanged cobras in the baby pens with the babies. The baby be like one years old. The babies be playing with cobras. They defang so they don't kill a baby, right? But it's the rooted out of the mind. Fear. It's not there. You have to use fear. You can't never get rid of it. You got to use fear. My brother's in the military. You already know. If you didn't go through the basic training, your ass would be scared to death out there. The basic training, they do what is called, it's called, um, it's mind control. It's programming. It comes from the Islamic paradigm and the Chinese taught people how to regiment psychology by making them pay attention to details. So whenever you were in the barracks and the drill sergeant said, hey, 
I see a uh, strand of hair inside of this toilet. I want all y'all to get up and clean this shit up <laughs> at 3.30 in the morning, right? What does this begin to do? This shit starts making your ass pay attention to the details. You start everything, you like this. And what they've done is they have activated Yahweh. They have activated Yahweh and the scripture tells you don't ask me who God is. Don't ask the preacher. Go to the book. The book tell you Yahweh is a man of war. The book tell you that Yahweh, the secret of Yahweh is fear. Hello? That's why your ass ain't scared to put that work in. <laughs> because you have been amplified, trained in the manner in which to address the physical world. Your visual cortex, yeah, this is your yod, yod, he, vow, he is seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. When they all come together, it's called quintessence, and that's called the hologram. That's called what you perceive reality to be. This is why you build pyramids with five points. This is why in Western Africa, they pulled Yahweh out of Western Africa in, in Kushite theology using the four points and directions and then created magic out of that. The only person that does magic is your four senses. That's it. That's why nobody has to believe in magic in order for magic to work on you. That's a lie. If anybody tell you that, that's bullshit that I don't have to believe. I don't believe in magic so it, it, it has no effect on me. That is so untrue. So untrue. Now, if sound is the vehicle of function, and this is why I deal with Kabbalah, because I challenged the text. The text told me what it is. It says that the Hebrew word pop, which equals 480, the same amount of, of years from, now I'm leaving stuff out because I'm building up my point, the same amount of years required for the building of the temple from the Exodus from a, for a reason. Now the Exodus, where was they leaving from? What was the exodus? Where they was leaving from? Slavery. They was leaving slavery. They was leaving slavery. But from where though? Egypt. From Egypt. But not damn. It don't say Egypt in the book. Who told you that? Israel. It don't say Israel in the book. Who told you that? Kemet. It don't say Kemet in the book. Kamaray Pharaoh. It don't say Kamaray. If they use a mythological term to describe a place that historians have put in Egypt. It's, it's Mutz. Mutz. It's, it, that's the root. It's Mitzrayim. Now Mitzrayim, the root of Mutz, it means any place their mounds are. Mutz means mound. Any place there's mounds can be your Egypt. Hello? And they are pyramids on every place on the planet. The biggest one is where? China. China. Okay. Now, the 480 years is the numeric stellar trajectory equation equaling the number of seconds required for the sun's light to reach you. It expresses the numeric matter in which light manifests through the lenses of darkness. <clears throat> so now the eight minutes, when we divide eight minutes, right, into how many seconds is in a minute? 60. Times 60 times eight, you get your 480. So the 480 years that they're talking about from the Exodus, to the building of the first temple is describing light's trajectory from darkness. Hello? Light. Now listen, light come from the darkness. Your sun ain't light like you think it is. That's an illusion. <coughs> My brother's going to clear all this shit up <laughs> when I finish. He's going to bring it all home. He's going to bring it all home. Right? That like that set the stage for us today. He's gonna bring it all home. Now, 
The 480 years is the numeric stellar trajectory equation equaling the number of seconds required for the sun's light to reach you. It expresses the numeric matter in which light manifests through the lens of darkness. Now people say, yo, I need you to go back to that old Kabbalah like back in the day. Because I started drifting. I started talking about politics and shit. And then all the haters come out. Because the politics is where all the haters is chilling. And all they doing is talking about politics and politics and all this bullshit. I already know who I am. I already know who the Caucasian is. I'm done with that shit. I'm going someplace else into the spiritual realm where we have to set up the stage for those people who are willing to actually die. In the Quran it says, long for death if ye are true. Long for death if ye are true. Let the bullet free you. Let the gunshot free you. All these people talking about life. Life is a fancy vanity. It's nothing. You heard? And you could tell those agents of spiritual repression who try to constantly keep your mind off the spiritual matters. You heard? Keep you fixed in material shit. I don't care what color no president is. The purple president could come out. I don't care. 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 You won't confuse me and have me all happy for nothing. You won't have me happy for some external circumstance that I know is futile. You understand? In the grand scheme of things. Feel me? So now, back to Kabbalah. This is where we're going straight with it. If you ain't with it, I, you know, not you folks here, but you know, I'm speaking to the, the, my, our brothers and sisters in our extended family. 480 as well equals the entity used by mythological Moses to channel the Ruach HaKadim known as Lilith. Many of us who've been watching these DVDs been hearing about Lilith for quite some time. We hear about Lilith but we vacillate her through our English mind. We think Lilith is an entity that is like, you know, feminine connotation. We've seen images of her and people are channeling images and in channeling the image, you can challenge the import of the magical uh, thing in which you intend to bring into existence. However, the real magician is a math magician. He goes to the very root of the entity, takes the number of the entity out and uses that. All kings in ancient times would build artifices and encode their names within the artifice by way of numeric principle. Okay? The king of King Sargon and Sumer did that. The ziggurats have his name in the numeric construct. Now, uh, we are not able to ex access the force and power of the very sounds our ancient builders left for us to utilize in order to access the free and abundant energy present and surrounding us at all times. We activate this power solely with sound. Now, it's crazy. And Moses, now let's look at the text. Now how the hell did Moses split the sea? Y'all been reading this Bible. Y'all been thinking, oh, Jesus and God and everything. But you never ask, well, how the hell, if this ain't but a few years ago, what the hell did he have then that I ain't got now? So why is he splitting seas and I, I got trouble making people understand me? Mm. Right? What's that about? Mythology. Let's look at the text. And then I've rendered a word for word just to show you, I didn't complete it, but just to show you some of the, how you are really supposed to read it. And Moses stretched out his hand. Now this is the poetic, anglicized version. Check it out though. He had a staff, mm -hmm. but it was in another verse. They never introduced the staff into this verse when he actually split the sea. Mm -hmm. Yahweh told him to go with the staff and split it, right? But when he actually split it, the staff is not in the text. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by the strong east wind all that night and made this sea dry land and the waters were divided. Don't it sound beautiful? Mm -hmm. Right? Now, in its word for word, it would sound and stretched. Moshe, the hand, because if it was his hand 
and language, they would have put it in the Hebrew, they would have had a cough at the end of the word hand. Now, as a person who sits and deals with the Hebrew, they only a few hundred, less than 3,000 words in Biblical Hebrew. We speak a language that has over 80,000 words, right? And if you speak English. Many of us who do speak English don't utilize not even a quarter of the 80,000, right? The mind of the ancients only had a very simple language to deal with. That's why they were so advanced. See? Simplicity is technology. Extra is the bullshit, right? Your telephone, the stuff that, that's done in your little phone used to be what one computer could do that they made 50 years ago that fill up this whole building, right? So the, ob the objective, you changing your tape? Okay. Gotta make sure that UK tape is tight, Jack. <laughs> Can't wait to get to London. <laughs> right? How y'all feeling? Y'all all right? Yeah. All right. Now, I'm going to tell you what Moses is. All you got to do is read the story. All you got to do is read the story. You want to know who Moses is? Read the story. I'm going to show you, though. Now, it says, and Moses, and Moses, and stretch. Moshe, and this is his real name, his name is only actually two letters. The final letter, in a sense, gives, gives, gives power and force to his first two letters. His first letter in his name is water. Water, simply. The second letter, letter in his name is, is tooth, but it, the connotation spiritually is fire or the sound shh. So it's the force within the water. You know, water has the ability, it conforms to the number six. It, in geometry, go ahead. Moshe in German is mosque. Ah. If you was to ask in German, if you was trying to get to the mosque for prayer, and you said, uh, voice the Moshe. Uh, wow. For, uh, for wow. What do you mean? Mosque. Uh, yeah. Church. Mass. Masjid. That's deep. That's deep. Now, now, that's, that's deep. And, and, it, and it tells you that in that, and we were doing the knowledge to the language here. And, and at first, I was thinking that German might be hard. But it really is not when you speak um, Nami. So I speak Nami. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So from the hood, we did, yeah, you know what I mean? We just, we just be making up shit as we go. You know what I'm saying? So it's not hard for us to be pliable to incorporate, you know what I mean, a means to, to speak. You understand? So especially when people come here who are speaking ancient languages, like someone who comes from an Arab country, they can snatch Deutsch like nothing because it's an older language. Greek, Greek, older language, you can snatch Deutsch. You know what I'm saying? It's nothing. It's nothing. So now, back to the Hebrew. And stretch Moshe the hand over the sea and recede Yahweh. And Yahweh means sensory perception as the quintessence of holographic image. That's all Jehovah is. He is sensory perception as the quintessence of holographic pineal image making. Moses was instructed to part the sea within himself first because that's the only place where the magic goes down. The sensory perception, right, is the foreground and then the hand that he's speaking about. I'm going to show you something deep. <laughs> Check this out. Hold, let me finish the verse. The sea and stretch Moshe, the hand over the sea and recede Jehovah. The sea, in wind, spirit, solar strong, all night. And I had to stop it because it was so incoherent 
that the only way that you would really understand the text is if you were versed in symbolic nuances of language and Kabbalism. The English translation of the Bible is only 10% of what it's actually saying. <clears throat> okay? It only is there to suit and boot the Western mind and keep it a slumber. Okay? Now, let me show you something else. Quick question. Go ahead, beloved. Uh, when you said 10%, is that related to tithes as well? Like we'll get into that too, because the whole tithes thing is a super deep science. You can heal yourself if you, if you, if you pay your tithes too. That's another way that, that I have been able to circumvent so much bullshit in my life is doing good things in secret. And that's what the tithes are. You tap into the 10% the of the universe that you can access, as Dot was speaking about yesterday, are symbolically encoded within the tithes. See, when you give 10%, you're giving 10% back to the physical world. But who is giving? You're giving out of the 90% of unseenness. You walk around with 90 all day in your, in your psyche. Everything that you hear is 10% of what is 90% of going on in the unmanifest realm. You understand? Now look, Ein Sof Or is equals 9. 414 equals 9. Ein Sof Or is the origin of, that is the real God of the Bible. Ein Sof Or is Asar. He is the perfect black one. Right? And I use the word black because I don't have another word to describe essentially this color because we have a uh, an ongoing a senseless debate that I do not want to continue participating in because it's being co-opted by provocatorism and um, the, the agent shit with the word black okay so the, a, a proper word for in Hebrew would could be shakur or kedem or, or Kidar. Those are good proper words for the color of blackness. Now the supreme, and that's what, that's what is unmanifest, that is dark matter. That dark matter is the 90%. Only 10% of it can make itself manifest and it does so in a beam of light that we're going to talk about later that has something to do with the solar, uh, the solar boat that Ra sits on. Now the supreme magical instruction for finding the point of orientation required to allow Yahweh to split the waters asunder reside within the numeric potencies of the text. Now in the text it said that he was instructed to use the hand, right? And the word for the hand is Yadu, right? Yadu really is Yod. It would be Yod, Val, Valif is hand, but in the text, they spell it Yod, Dalif, Val, and it equals 20, right? And then, the way that it was split, this is how the, the ancient, the minds of the ancients were not in the same, constructed in the same manner in which we construct our thinking and our thought process. They, when they want to say that something is strong, right? They would put, if they want to say that I am a strong man, they would say I'm strong of hand in the language. That's how it would be. Right? This is how their mind worked. They would put things in a specific order in order for psychology to develop what, what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? So now, the C. And the hand becomes synonymous in the text because the seed is not split asunder until he actually activates it with his hand. In this verse, where, where it goes asunder, it's in uh, 14, 19, 19 to 21 in Exodus, it don't split asunder until he puts his hand over it. So I went to the text, I said, let me add the, and th these are the definitive markers you'll find in language. Now, the way we get the word the is really a vestige of the Hebrew af, word af. Af is, means the beginning and end. In the Zohar, they said the, the, the aleph and the tau has the same connotation as alpha and omega in the Greek. When someone says something comes from the alpha and the omega, what is it? It comes from the what? The beginning and the what? And the end. 
Okay, how are we looking for term? You're good. Okay. Now, the C, ah, meaning the. So it says the hand and the C. Now, the C equals 55. So I did some Kabbalah. I said, let me add them and see what comes. 20 is a Kabbalistic numeric symbol of deity whose name is Yeya. Right? Now, 55 is a Kabbalistic numeric symbol of God's female consort, whose title is Kala, which means bride and is a Kabbalistic alternate term for Malkuf, the physical world. So when Moshe put his hand over the sea, what was occurring was there was a marriage which was ensuing. Now, in alchemy, it speaks excuse me, constantly of the divine marriage. The symbol of marriage is very significant for psychology. This is why when you go to, the, that's why the wedding in every culture is a major ritual. Major ritual. Italian wedding, African wedding, African, whatever, different parts of the world, wherever you at, German wedding, they always have intricate aspects of culture. In some cultures, before the honeymoon, the woman has to sit on her lap with a baby boy. Right? First I said, why? They reenacting the Heru myth <coughs> with the mother and child. But more importantly, the boy child has an electromagnetic field that makes the woman's ovaries ovulate setting up the stage for the honeymoon. Holla, mm. right? Now, 20 plus 55 equals 75, which is Layla, meaning night. However, when we jumble these letters, we receive Halal, meaning Lucifer. Mm. Now, Layla, those of you who are Muslim, if you ever fasted and during the month of Ramadan, you remember the Laylatul Qadri night where the night was the night of power. Check it out, true. The Laylatul Qadri is very significant in Islam during the month of Ramadan because that is the night when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers all prayers. He only do it at night. During the last, the odd number of the last 10 days of Ramadan. <clears throat> okay? So now, and I, and I reference Islam for a reason. I always reference Islam because Islam is a, is a balancing point. It's the checks and balance for other, other religious systems. And it's the perfection of the other ones. Now, Freemasonry is presently Western man's desire to follow Eastern, Asiatic, or Kushite stellar theology. The myth of King Solomon's temple merges fully in the mythology of Freemasonry. A distinct and fully functioning mythology is what is required to activate the caverns of the Western mind. The Western mind's need for spiritual symbolism to guide it through the dark world of our present aeon. So Freemasonry, in a sense, is what is the basic fundamental premise used by Western man to guide himself through the world. He cannot, Western man cannot sit down and meditate and still whoop your ass, take your money in taxes, and be the IRS agent and, and do all of that. He has to use a different system of spirituality. He cannot use Eastern philosophy. Eastern philosophy is not aggressive enough for him to have a commercial venue. You know what I'm saying? A commercial venue that is aggressive. You know what I mean? And Freemasonry affords the Western man the ability to sit and act like a Moor. He can sit and don the fez. He can sit and wear the, the clothing of essentially the indigenous people of the planet and operate within their venue spiritually in their spiritual system of commerce as well as the physical world of commerce. Okay? So now,
Now, Jesus Christ, how we fix that? Now, I done, the things is under there, but let me show you what this is. Now, do you remember when I spoke to you? I, I, excuse me, my bad, y'all. I got the, the letters under here. No need to apologize, because I can explain it. <laughs> now, the 72 names of God are what you see here, right? The 72 names of God are the actual tools used by the mythological Moses to split or receive the Red Sea. This is the, this is the means and the manner by which to open up the caverns in the sky or the portals in the sky and channel down cosmic imperative. Now, where do we get these 72 names from? The 72 names from come from a number of 216 letters that are in three verses. The three verses that I'm talking about is Exodus 14, 19 through 21. In Exodus 14, 19 through 21, it speaks about the whole setting the stage for Moses to split the Red Sea. He doesn't split it until he gets to uh, the, uh, chapter 21. Now, what they did was they took 72 letters from one verse. Each of the three verses have 72 letters in them. They put 72 letters in this way, then put 72 this way, this way, 72 this way, and then 72 this way. Now, they called that um, the, the, the way of the ox. Oxes plow in this way. On land, they plow this way, then they go this way, and then they go this way, right? Now, they read the three verses going down and render, take three letters out of each of them and render 72 names. Now, each of the 72 names are angelic names. Some end with the name El and some end with the name Yah to describe the masculine and female potential of the angelic forces, right? Now, they, at least they afford us female angels in this <laughs> Kabbalah. There's no female angels in Christianity, unfortunately. I don't know what the angels are doing up there by themselves, <laughs> right? So now, you have at your access the ability to bring down cosmic and light code, what you call it, imperatives housed in these sounds. And the ancients put this there for a specific reason. Now, this is what Moses really means. Moses means water vehicle breath. His name means water vehicle breath. The mythological Moses is a code word detailing ancient methods used by priests for channeling stellar imperatives. Stellar gnosis is given to the son from the mother through breastfeeding and storytelling. You get your high science in the, the process of breastfeeding. If you were not breastfed, fed, you better get you some titty now. <laughs> because because that's where the truth is at. That's if you know somebody that you trust that's that weaning, get you a cup. Real talk for the simple fact that the Milky Way, the Milky Way comes down through the knoff, the nipple, the knop. The word P, the letter P is is synonymous with the F sound, F sound, right? So when you, now, 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 I don't want to blow it up. I'm going to get to another point. Let's go here now. Look, uh, it's storytelling. Now go and call, now this is from Exodus 2-7. Now this is when they pulled little baby Moses out the manger, right? Very significant that this is the very crucial element of the story. Without this part of the story, the whole shit don't make no sense. Okay? Go and call a woman from you a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may, that she may nurse the child. Now here we have a Anunnaki reptilian mother feeding her child. The Hebrew word for breastfeeding is nook. 
In the term, in the term, anunnazis, the, 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 the feeding, the feeding. Now, what is a baby doing when a baby feeds and sucks on the titty? What happens? The pons region, which surrounds the pineal gland, is stimulated. Sucking breast milk stimulates pineal function. If the pineal is activated, stellar imperative is embossed into the child. The child is now a priest. Hello? You remember Mork and Mindy? Mm -hmm. With Nanu Nanu? Nanu, Nanu. Who were the adults? The children. the children were the adults in Mork and Mindy. Mork's pops was like five years old. <laughs> know what I'm saying? You become a, a ch you become uh, 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 you you born an adult and you become a child. <laughs> All right. Now, the Hebrew word for breastfeeding is nook. The root of nook is nu, which shares the same root as noon, which means fish, as in nomo from the cosmology of the Dogon. Check, check. The Hebrew letter noon equals the number fifty, and fifty are the number of ancestors who came on the Shem to seed the daughters of men with the seeds of God. So the noon, which means the fish, the sperm, is stellar. When they talk about the Anunnaki, remember when he said, "This is what made Zachariah Sitchin write all them books." He could not find a meaning of the word. Uh, Nephilim. In the in the in the in the English, Nephilim kept saying what? Giants. Giants. Like the New York Giants? Giants? What the fuck are you talking about? The Giants. Giants? He said, no, I'm gonna challenge the text and went in and challenged the text and was beginning to find I thought that was the Gibor. The Gibor, what do you mean? The the giants, I thought that was the Gibor. And I thought the Nephilim was the, the, the half half. See, but when you go into the poetic anglicized version of the book, mm -hmm. they always use the English variant giant to to supplement Nephilim, because they don't know what Nephilim is. The M at the end of it means it's plural. The Nephal is the nipple, brother. The nipple. It's what comes out of her nipple is the Nephilim into the child. The child becomes the, the, the housing of God. The black man is God. Through the breast milk does he does he the seed, all seeds with divine potential, brother. He, he uplinks the DNA through that. If you, if, I'm telling you, it is very crucial to have breastfed children. If you have a child now and the woman is not breastfeeding, you are not creating a healthy, sentient, priestly being. You got to have that. Know what I'm saying? If you don't have it now, you're going to have troubles in the child's life and they're going to have to supplement it later on in some form of fashion. And a lot of the maladies that we are presently seeing today, many of the people who are, I'm 33 years old, 34 years old, and the problems that I see that are prevalent in the people my age and, and, and before and after me, are uh, they are lacking spiritual development. People are grossly, grossly, like on a whole nother level, insecure. And whenever you're insecure on this level, this is evidence of spiritual underdevelopment and emotional underdevelopment. And you get developed first on an emotional level with mommy. That's why it was so significant that we opened up yesterday with the brother's mother. She set the, she's the one actually who set the stage. Yes. Okay? She's the one that set the stage. Okay, now, here's a depiction of the Shem Hamaforish. This is from, was he a German? I believe Athanasius Kircher was a German. He's one of the first Europeans to dedicate uh, in writing an extensive work on Kabbalah. And I think this is a woodcut from one of his books. If I'm mistaken, please tell me. Now, the pillars 
on the porch of King Solomon's temple equal DNA. And DNA equals the pillars, the external pillars on the Etz HaKayim, on the tree of life. Right? Now, the pillars on the porch, now the porch on King Solomon's temple is called the Ulam. The, num the Ulam, the word itself, equals the number 77, right? 77 is very significant when we get into Kabbalistic uh, sorcery because it was used for 9-11. They oriented the whole event off of the number 66 and 11. Combined, they were 77. 66, they made the enemy of 9-11, which is really their ally, Allah. And the UK Allah. Bombs. What you say? The UK bombers was going on seven. <laughs> now let me show you something. Let me show you something. I'm, uh, take this back to the UK. Look, 9-11, take away the number 77 equals the Hebrew word Megdal, which means tower. And tower equals 834. Now, the sorcerers who did 9-11 were Kabbalists. They sat there and fixed all that shit in numbers before they pulled that stunt. Okay? 834 take away 77 equals 757, which is the 757, which is the type of plane they used. Okay? Okay? Now, two towers is the word Megdalim. I told y'all that yum at the end of any word pluralizes it. Magdalim, okay, equals, has two equal equivalencies. Uh, uh, where the fuck is this sound? Okay, Magdalim, 127, hold on, 477, take away, okay, four, and Magdalim, 527. I gotta do this shit. I'll show y'all later. This shit goes into some whole other shit. This is some old notes. The word 477 equals the word terror. Hello? They go your 77 again. And then 477 take away 911 equals 434, which means Daleth or the door. 911 was a portal opening event. Terra plus door equals beginning. Fear's entry begins or starts a giving context of existence. The door lies in the center. The middle is the way. Fear is the medium by which one may enter into the sacred pillar of genetic DNA configuration. The way to get into anybody's DNA or to get into their imprint is by way of fear. This is why they can all make us relatives on a DNA level with an event that happens external to us all that utilizes fear. This is why we all have the same page. Time? Raise the threat level. Raise the threat level. <coughs> That's right. That's right. Altering the configuration and thus beginning a new template structure, a lattice to accommodate the infrastructural mandates of the adversary's agenda. Now, the three, five, and seven steps of Freemasonry conceal the numeric manner in which to spin intent interdimensionally throughout the universe using light and sound as its primary medium. This is why they are associated with the winding staircase in the second degree. The three, five, are actually, the three and the five are actually the musical three and a half used to measure scale and a progression towards achieving a full measure of musical sound. I may have said it a little off, but the three, five, and seven, the three and the five deal with sound and how sound is the activating vehicle for interdimensional travel. The spin of, when you, uh, uh, when we get into our UFOs, when we start getting the UFOs popping, y'all, the Germans, y'all supposed to be building them. This is where the first one was at. So where's your shit at? 
<laughs> Where your UFO parked at? Can't tell you. Okay, that. okay, okay. <laughs> when you get one, I guarantee that the best means of travel when you get into it is going to be sound. Sound is going to be the medium of, and they even have in, in uh, new sound weaponry. They're using weapons. They're using weaponry that's rooted in sound because sound can disturb any medium. They can melt your ass with sound. Scientists have even used a high-pitched sound to freeze liquid helium. Now, how are you going to use sound to freeze something? They also have a, a science called sonom, sonoambulance, where they can use sound to make light, brother. Why do you, why you think they say in the beginning? Why you say God said in the beginning? Let there be what? Light. Islamically, what do they say? Kun fire kun. Be and it what? And it is. Right. But with Waco, with Koresh and them, they got him with, uh, they were using rock and roll music to confuse them inside of the actual, um, the compound. They were playing it for days. So the new attack is going to be, is going to be sound well, and got, visuals. They got them for power control now. In, in the inner cities, they're using the sound weapon. Yeah. They no longer have horses and, you know, building clubs and all that. They got the, the sound, they hit you with the sound weapons and it's clearing crowds out. Yeah, it's so powerful, it can make people throw up. It can make you kill over. Like, That's what they use it to get, um, to get like, a terrorist and stuff now. Because they go into, like, um, non-lethal uh, weapons. Mm -hmm. so they actually have it now so they can... You know, but let me tell you something. I'd rather get shot than shot with some sound because the sound can totally reconfigure your DNA. It can emboss within your very soul a command. You don't know what frequency, what words, what are they saying to you. They could be telling you all kind of stuff. You know, and you remember when they always had the public service announcements? That in the case of emergency, when you hear the sound, and all that shit, they've been programming us for years with sounds, man. And in the states, when you hear the whoop 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 whoop, all of a sudden niggas just stop. What the fuck? You ain't doing nothing. You just went outside to go to the store. You hear the whoop whoop. Then they put it with the with the colors, with the red and the blue, and you feel like you did some shit. You be like this. You start walking straight up, you like this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's not checking your Sound. Exactly. You start, yeah, you be like this. I'm dirty. I'm good. Yeah. Now, uh, act uh, are actually, okay, are associated with the measure scale and progress to achieving the sound. The half is, of course, five as half of a whole is 50% of it. The number five represents the middle chamber spoken of in... 1 King 6 8. For my, my Masonic brothers, you take the notes. Now, length, depth, and width are the three dimensions required to find the volume of a rectangular solid. The solid body is a holographic projection of King David's pineal gland. Solomon and the numeric manner in which to find the volume of the cube is his name, Sholema, which equals. 375. See, Solomon is a variant of the three, five, and seven steps of natural progression towards manufacturing a physical thing by way of the descent of cosmic influx. So you can, everything that you do, you spin into existence. Like if you had a magical wand and we was teaching people, you see on Harry Potter, you just can't stick the wand out, you gotta spin it, right? When you make the sala and you in the, uh, what is that, Jalsa? I believe in Jalsa, you are instructed to, to say the Tasha hood. You have to take your finger and spin it like this. You're spinning your intent. You're bringing things into being. This is, some, this is a part of Islamic prayer. You have to put your hand on your knee, your right finger, and spin it like this. See? Everything got to spin. Which equals 375 in this variation of, three, of the three, five, and seven steps. And King Solomon went, this is very important. This is very important. 
And King Solomon went and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. He was a widow's son of the tribe of Naphtali. They go that word again, Naph. What I told you Naph mean, nipple. Now when you put Naphtali, right? The Thali in Hebrew is the pole star. The pole star is the star that orients everybody. When Hiram, who is a man versed in what? A widow's son of the tribe of Natali and his father, a man of Tyre, a worker in brass. And he was filled with wisdom, understanding, and cunning to work in brass. The brass that they're talking about, here's this from my man KB Unk, man. Shout out to KB Unk, man, in Atlanta. This is a fishy. This joint got the crystal and all that. Now, the brass that they're talking about ain't nothing but your DNA. It's your crystal. Brass or copper, brothers and sisters, are a, is a significant additive to your DNA. Copper is so very significant for healing. It acts as an analgesic. You can actually take copper and rub it on bruises and they'll heal. Okay? Copper also responds to your electromagnetic field and your thought process. If you're dealing with some awful shit, your brass uh, metallic thing will get very tarnished. Fast, the way to clean it, you're going to need acid that you can get out of ketchup and lemons to clean it off, to get the, the, the look again. Okay, so why when you enter into the Temple of Solomon, is there always the Temple of Solomon, this here, why must you first, in order to enter it, you must first what? Walk in between its what? Its pillars on the porch. Boaz and what? Yakin. Both equaling the number 79. Hello? 79, which is an extension of 77. 79 only means in 77. In strength. See, the word Boaz means in strength. As, as is also synonymous with the goat. The goat is what? The goat is what? Sacrificial animal. Sacrificial. Deals with Aries. Deals with setting something off. It deals with strength. A billy goat kicks is rough, right? Don't care. And when, when, I, when I got my third degree, they kept, they kept trying to scare people. I ain't gonna go into that. But that goat is everywhere. That goat is everywhere. It's primal. He was filled, let's go back to the text. It says he was filled with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Now, for years, everybody been reading the text, but ain't been going to Kabbalah to see what the hell the wisdom, understanding, and knowledge that Yahweh, or, or, or excuse me, that Hiram was filled with. The wisdom, understanding, and knowledge ain't nothing but these, these Sephiroth right here. Can you see all this dot? Yep. Is Hokma. Hokma. He was filled with wisdom, understanding, Bina, and Das. Das. For those of you who are trying to figure out what Das is, Das ain't nothing but the portal. It's the portal through which you see this Keter? You see this swirl? Remember in the beginning? The first William Blake picture, the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is another representation of this swirl. Now this swirl creates your compass and your compass and square motif. You see? At the top of the, of the compass, you always see the screw there so you can move it around, right? But that compass represents Keter. Keter, the word Keter means to circle. What do you use a compass for? Make sense. To make a circle, right? Kabbalistic Freemasonry, right? Now here's the Gebor you were speaking of. You, you remember you said the word Gebor? Now Gebor Ah symbolized the fifth Sephiroth and it equals the number, this is a side note, it equals the number 216 which is the same equivalent for fear. 
Okay? Now, Kesed is, uh, is, is the opposite of Gibor. That's how you defeat Gibor. When someone comes at you with it, somebody comes at you like this, what? What you want, son? You, you want to get it in? You use Kesed. You use mercy. Mercy is far more powerful. That's why it comes before rigor on the tree of life. See? The planet is Jupiter. You need Jupiter for to the abundance of Jupiter to subject Mars. You heard? There you go. You know? <laughs> now <laughs> here we go. Very interesting. Who's this? Keith Ledger. Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger has what around his neck? A noose. A noose. That is the... Of course, you know, a noose mean to us. Mississippi, right? <laughs> you niggas start thinking about Alabama. Georgia, right? The peach trees. The noose is a Masonic symbolism. In masonry, it's called what? It's called the cable toe. Right? Now, very interesting. He has some symbols on his head. I want y'all to see this. Come up here. Y'all might not be able to see it from back there. I want y'all to come up here. Get close and see this. He's got some very interesting symbols on his head. Right here appears to be a three. This appears to be a triangle of sorts. And is this a Greek letter? It's an F. A feet. Phi or, or pi. Phi. Right? Now, this is between takes in the new Heath Ledger movie that came after Batman. Although he died, check, check out. Uh, 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 it's the, uh, for the adventures of Professor Parsippanus or something like that. Something to that effect. You can... With the computer, you ain't got to ask nobody no questions no more. You can go find out the name of it. But this is between takes. And this is a picture of him. They're about to film him in a ritual murder. Now, in the UK, there was, and I'll get back to you on this, there was a historically murder that was never solved of a mason, right? Killed by masons and he was killed in accordance to Masonic ritual. And whenever you're killed in accordance to Masonic ritual in the States, the police are instructed never to pursue the case. They are not to pursue your killers. Okay? If you, if you get split asunder and your tongue snatched out and you by the sea or water, whenever they kill that ass by water, and in this movie, he's going to be hanging off of a, a, off of a bridge right over water. You understand? Now, how did they continue to make the movie with Heath Ledger? Y'all can sit down now. Y'all niggas are all on me now. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. How can they continue to make the movie if he did? This is how they did it. They used three actors. Each time Heath Ledger walks through a, a, a magic mirror, one of these three actors come out on the other side. Hello? These three are very significant. Not the three actors, but the number itself is very, very, very significant. That three symbolizes what I, in my, in my cosmology, are these three Sephiroth, which are Sirius A, B, and C. I say Keter, Hokma, Bina are Sirius A, B, and C. The occultists, the unfortunate in them people's been trying to say the, the Society for Inner Light have been saying that Doth encompasses Sirius itself. That I do not agree with. Doth is dark matter. Doth is the lens by which these three realize themselves in the holographic universe below in the sixth Sephiroth called the realm of Yetzirah or the Sephiroth Habanim, which are the builders of the holographic world. Okay, so now, ritually, the ritual sacrifice of Heath Ledger, because he was murdered, 
He was given, he was murdered and the operatives and handlers in that murder was the one of the twins, the Mary Kate uh, uh, Olsen twin. She's the one that gave him that bum ass medication, that bum ass Zantax, whatever that shit was that killed him, right? Yeah. Now, if you come to my house and you find me dead, Curtis, right. and you call True Master and say, yo, True, Rashid in here dead, come over. And he come over, and y'all be like, oh shit, he is dead. Right? Yeah. Call Dot. Dot come over. Yo, this nigga dead, son. And then y'all call the police. Who you think going to jail? Y'all niggas going to jail. <laughs> right? Right. Now, how do Heath Ledger, he laid out, the masseuse get there, she don't know what to do. She said, let me call Mary Kate Olsey. Let me call her. So she called Mary Kate. Mary Kate said, oh, he's just laying there. Don't call the hospital. Call my private security team. They'll come down. And her private security team was the cleanup crew that made sure that the crime scene was effectively placed in order. That was an insurance scam for Hollywood to recoup off of the recession. Simple. You heard? And to transdimensionally put one of their rising and shining suns, he played everything under the sun, but he played, he played also one of the people that took Puff Daddy out of cell number 13 and Monsters Ball to, the, to, the, to, to his death. You understand? Besides him playing a fag, besides him playing a clown, besides all of that, look where they finna put him now that he's dead. You heard? And these auspicious symbols upon his head. Now, I put this as an x-ray photo of a nebula. This is the crab nebula, but the x-ray photo. If you were to see the actual photo, it looks nothing like this. There is activity going on. This is what the equivalent of Doth would be. It is a portal, cosmic one. See it? You see, it seems like a, it's a point of light with a circle around it and then a gas shooting out of it. This is particles of who we are, what we are composed of. What's that, What's that? That's the Crab Nebula, x-ray photo of it, right? Now, Bina is the builder. Now, this is how the lightning bolt goes. Ein Sof Or sends intelligence to Kether. Kether goes to Hukma, Hukma goes to Bina, and then Bina sends her son, her children, her Anunnaki, her Nun, Right? Through the galactic lensing of Doth, which is extremely painful. That's why birthing is so painful. Birthing is painful, and so is what? Dying sometime, ain't it? Because when you die, you go back the opposite way. See? They discourage Kabbalists to, to get too far entrenched into the three supernals because they're speaking to the Eurocentric mind because if they get too deep into this, they can go beyond, they can go into a dark place that they cannot come back from. You ever heard people getting going crazy from getting too spiritual? That's what can happen. Okay? All of Dr. York, people from that era, if you wasn't in tune with your shit, my man will spook your ass. He had you bugging. Them Africans in Senegal will spook you too. If you have, if you have an English language, it's so easy for you to get mind control because our language is rooted in mind control. It's rooted, it's, it has so many limitations and its foundation is fear. Side note, uh, when you was talking about the Kabbalah <clears throat> and 9-11, uh, in, in some schools of thought, the number 10 will represent God or the completion of everything. That's why the word Dios or Diaz is 10. So by them going 9-11 was their ritualistic way to bypass God. There you go. Numerically. Or to actually use God as the very benefactor of what they intend to bring into existence. Exactly. And the Sefer Yetzer, it says that they are 10 Sephiroth, not 9, 10 Sephiroth, not 11. Mm -hmm. They are, and this is a book written by the Moors. We gave them the goddamn science for that event. And Crowley crystallized it and made 11 the number of magic. He's the one that Boom. did the ritual. Now, here we have the commission form of bringing down the Anunnaki. We have the Sumerian form of bringing down 
the Anunnaki, and we have the Christian form, the breastfeeding. And Kabbalah was said to be discovered in Provence, France. Well, this, I have no problem with you saying that, as long as you recognize that Provence, France was populated by the world's indigenous people of color. Simply because in Provence they had over 100 black Madonnas in secret, distinct locations. They were worshipping who essentially we are for aeons. Okay? And that's it. And I've come to the completion of the slide presentation. We got time for a few questions. A few questions. Ask general questions. Don't matter. You wanna know where I got this t-shirt? 125th Street. 125th Street? That's right. My man Jack, Soul Brothers Boutique. You wanna know how to get any of this stuff? KB Unk Man, holla at us. 718-506-4518. You can call us in the States. It's 718-506-4518. Or you go online. AARashid.com, we get you in t contact with everybody. Shout out. Shout out to the blue pill, the black pill, and the red pill. <laughs> shout out to Sonetta. That's my man. I, 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 Azariah. Shout out to all the brothers in Jersey who are uh, selling the DVDs. Brothers in Philly, my man Ali, my man Hakeem and them at, at, the, uh, at Black and Nobel. Everywhere. My man Josh Sun on Franklin, Jabril on, on Fulton and Nostrand. We doing it. Go ahead, Mommy. I'm sorry. Oh, no. I just wanted to um, I'll make a comment about what you were stating before about the children that are not breastfed. Yes, ma'am. Um, with the mothers that are not breastfeeding their children. Um, there, there's already a big problem. There's a big problem right now because the children are coming in uh, undernourished and they're coming in very small. They've got a lot of problems now with all these babies that are coming in this world that are just small. Well, I've seen a my, population of, of babies that are just small. I just had a baby on September 22nd. My wife gave birth and September? My baby boy? Yeah, September 22nd. <laughs> right? Now, I wanted her to be a Scorpio, that's why. I'm trying to push it to October. <laughs> but September 22nd, I had my baby, and she was seven pounds, four ounces. We had her at home, not, nothing, none of that bullshit. My girl squatted, four pushes, the baby was out. She, when the water broke, she said, let's go shopping. She didn't lay out, waiting. She went to go get some vegetables. We cooked. She went, said, I'm going in the room to have this baby. Come on. Called the midwife. Boom, bam. Baby was seven pounds, four ounces. In 30 days, the baby is over 10 pounds with nothing but breast milk. Right. Nothing but breast milk. She makes her breast milk rich by eating nuts. She eats cashews and almonds, and she eats a lot of vegetables. And, and the other thing, even, in, even as far as trying to su supplement these um, babies, um, what we found is worked very, 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 very well is colostrum. 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 Right. That's the colostrum is the, the beginning of the form of the milk. That's right. The mother. So and the colostrum is what helped my baby push out the first, what's the first doodle -doo they push? Yeah. 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 That's what helped her. And the colostrum, I thought the colostrum was the milk and it's not. Wow. That's, yeah. the, that's the form of the milk. That's right. So if you even, if they can help to supplement that, they have it. And I watch these children who, um, have been supplemented by that. Like for instance, the one my my grandson that was the three that was the three pounds right. that had the uh, the um, the heart uh, problem and also the the, the kidney that was so small. Mm. And there so now you should see he's like a linebacker. Right. You know what I mean? The the, the shoulders, everything came out is very 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 strong. Right. Right now you just see that through his bones and not even. It, it, it's a lot bigger than I did that for, he's, like I said, he's only 20 months old right now. So, you know, he's doing very, very, very well. But that colostrum every day. That's right. Every day to nurture him for, for what he couldn't get. It's like almost impossible to be unless that, you have that type of nurturing. You, gotta, you really are going to lose. That's our, that's our power, Mom, yeah. over the future is 
the connection between the mother and the child. If the child, if there is a woman, babies that's born cesarean section, the woman does not secrete a crucial hormone which connects her emotionally to the child. See? The reason why so many cesareans is because they got the women laying on their backs. That's, that goes totally against, it, yeah, it goes against the laws of gravity. When you go to Kemet, the hieroglyphic for a woman giving birth is her squatting by herself. She's not accompanied by nobody. And another trick for women to make the milk come down is for the women to sit in the, in the Islamic position of Jalsa. She must bend her knees. Her knees have to be bent. And all, for some reason, it brings the milk down like a flood. You understand? And that is the mercy of Allah. When I say Allah, I'm speaking about the all. That is the mercy of Allah showing us the benefits of humility and how the woman must be humble in order for our nation to succeed. Because if she lacks humility and deals with the haughtiness of what men essentially, you know, this is what throws off the whole planet. This is why don't, know, don't nobody know where they are in a gender, this is a gender, gender blind society. Nobody cares about gender no more. Nobody wants to do masculine, men don't want to do masculine things no more. Women don't want to do women things no more. Women want to box, men want to do ballet. You know what I'm saying? It's, and, and, and we are complaining and we're complaining about the essentially the nature in, in, in which the world is unfolding and it's all because we are going against the actual evidence as it is given. It's one and then two. And, and, it's absolutely right. I'm, I'm, I'm really living proof of that because well, like I stated yesterday, all those illnesses, all those weaknesses I like to say when I came in this world physically were against me as soon as I start having those babies on a regular, everything looked fine. That's you know but, because I, you see, you were joking. You yeah. was like, but God, if you no. need another Moses, another Jesus, no. but look at no. that's what you were doing. That's right. You were making manifest that's God right. in the physical realm in order for him to participate in this world. That's right. You understand? And that is something that is so very female and crucial. Another thing is when the women had the babies, they ain't supposed to be shooting back to work. Women that have babies, that have children, have to be home with the child. If she's not home with the child, the child is going to develop emotional problems and will be insecure and insecure niggas. That's why we got so many niggas that's afraid, they insecure, they deal with lack, they do bitch ass shit, they don't confront issues, they just, they be snitching, they bitches, you know what I'm saying? And I don't speak to bitches. Bitch ass niggas in particular, you know what I'm saying? You know? So this is why it is. Your ass wasn't nurtured. And that's why you got so many men that hate women. They weren't nurtured. They weren't nurtured. You got so many homosexuals. They weren't nurtured in the way of loving women. Way of loving women. The connection is so deep on that level. And I have to agree to again on that because again I stated, when I had my babies, I didn't even go anywhere without them. Right. Whenever you, whenever your woman got to get up and go to work, she's going to clean somebody else's house. I don't care if she's a secretary. I don't care if she's the CEO. She's cleaning somebody else's house. You brothers have to begin to give your whiz, and this is the final word that I'm going to say. You have to begin to give your whiz something else to do besides going to work for another man. Because she's taking away resources out of your house to give somebody else, right? While your child is ailing. And until you can address that, you really ain't got shit to talk about. Make it so your whiz can stay home and don't got to get up every morning to go work for the white man. And then make it so she don't even feel like she's being less of a person if she don't work. Because my whiz, and I talk my walk, my whiz is in the crib. And I told her she never got to go back to work. You work for me. And you just sit there and operate the little thing, because I'm Riri. I can't, when it was time to get the passport, I ain't know what to do, nothing. <laughs> so thanks to her, my queen gave me a beautiful baby. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Give it up.
I don't eat rockin' some, some Frankie Mac. The regular, the, the true love joint. No. How you think true? Yeah, yeah. You own. We good? We good. All right. Well, y'all seen A. Rashid just just tear it up. He really sliced me up. You know, I was in the back like. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. See, when you have your mind fixed in a certain kind of frequency, that's how you know that things are sinking up and it's higher than even your own perception. It comes, it's my altering. It alters your perception. And you have no choice but to bend your will and actually push the envelope. So now that you got this, now that the standard is raised, with the question you posed to yourself, what do I need to do in order to raise the standard higher? Mm. So I was in the back bugging like, wow, all right, I need to, I need to get it together. You know, I figured it, I got, I figured it out. I got it. And so it just goes to show uh, what all is in you. He, he talked about the 90% of that dark matter, which you don't see, that, 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 that 10% allows you to see. So you bring things from the unseen to the seen. You know, my background, Nation of God's Nervous, we make the unseen seen and uh, the unheard seen and heard everywhere. You see what I'm saying? They say the God is seen and heard everywhere. So that's how we bring that out of that dark matter consciousness, that 90% into being as a gift for the people to even participate in that, the other 10% that you see. The God told me when, when I was going through my lessons, he said, you could fill a thimble with what you know, but you could fill a thousand universes with that which you don't know. So you could take that in, into perspective and really elevate you know, within self and along the lines with all of this information that's coming, because it's powerful. Everybody is like, wow. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Now, the next brother is definitely really, really going to bring it home. And the first time I seen this brother, it was on uh, the Indigo Children. If y'all don't got it out there in TV land, find somebody, jack them, whatever, and get the Indigo Children, because it was definitely uh, mind-boggling. You see what I'm saying? And everybody... No true master from the hip hop world, you know, the producer from Wu Tang. I, we've been, I've been bugging lately, still been bugging, just the fact that this all even took place and the fact that we got uh, a person who not industry. You see what I'm saying? You got, you got the people with the, with the high facade and, and everything, and this brother is the, one of the most humble brothers I ever met in my life. He even had to bring my humility down, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I had, to, I had to turn down the, the ruckus button, I had to turn it down, you see what I'm saying? Because that, the energy, and if you ever met True, you see what I'm saying, you know that that's a warm brother, and he, he gonna want to reciprocate that same kind of warm peace energy, or else you can't even be around him. See what I'm saying? And to know, uh, after I seen the Indigo Child, I said, yo, I got to. <laughs> I got to get this brother over here. And it just so happened that I talked to Rashid on the phone, and he was like, I was like, yo, you know True Master? Yeah, that's my brother. As soon as you said this whole idea, this is who I had in mind. So we had it in mind in synchronicity. So it regardless to whom or what. When things have to get accomplished, things get accomplished in, in the mental and in the physical is the last thing to catch up. Yeah. So, without further ado, we're going to bring up this brother, Brother True Master. Yeah. 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 Peace, Lord. Peace, Lord. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, man. It's an honor to be here, man. It's an honor to meet all my, my brothers, you know what I mean, on this side. My brother travel over there. I met the other night, you know what I mean? Your old earth, definitely a queen, you know what I mean? And it's like everything that's been lining up, the synchronicity of everything that we've been dealing with is basically allowing us to enjoy a heightened level of perception, what we would call a hyperdimensional uh, level of perception. And this is why we should always pay attention to synchronicities and things that align themselves up 
because they give us an opportunity to walk through time barriers, through, to walk through worlds, so to speak, and give us a whole new insight on something. Um, it's a tremendous amount of synchronicity around all of us right here in Bavaria. Now, uh, in doing my research, um, I like to give honor to some of our ancestors like Noble Drew Ali because without those keys, we wouldn't be able to decipher and decode this information, which is so important to us at this time. Um, the name of the lecture is actually called Return of the Solar Sovereigns. This is actually the lecture that uh, I think is very relevant in giving us a ground and understanding of all of our history here. And then we're going to basically expound on it with the return of the solar sovereigns and show that sovereignty itself is explicitly connected to the solar principle. Okay, Rashid spoke about the solar principle earlier. Dot spoke about the solar principle. And in the solar principle, there is a completeness, a wholeness um, that when it's ignored, it can lead us down the path of all types of confusion, you know what I'm saying? All types of uh, conflict, inner conflict as well as external conflict. Um, and so we're going to focus on things that uh, created a lot of dissension and a lot of uh, conflict amongst our people and also see how we can reestablish the completeness, the wholeness, the unity amongst us, which is inevitable. And that's why we're here right now. And this is basically, um, I didn't expect to be in Bavaria when I did this lecture so soon. I mean, I was hoping to come out here and I really didn't anticipate um, a brother from the, from, the, from the nation that I'm in to be here, to welcome me here. That's even bigger than I could even imagine. Um, and like you were just saying about the, the, the light spectrum and dark matter, that's basically like saying knowledge born. You know what I'm saying? And knowledge born, that's because the solar principle is complete. You know, that's why it's one. You know what I'm saying? Um, the complete one. And it projected a artificial uh, 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 buffer for it to experience without any, any real harm coming to itself, so to speak. Now, even the creator, if you really want to understand the creator, you have to just look at yourself. We all take a rest. You know what I'm saying? The creator takes a rest. That's why the scriptures say on the seventh day he rested. You know what I'm saying? Um, so even though the solar principle is projecting itself here as a constant principle, it also needs a rest. Okay? Now, um, let's, let's get into this and then we're going to get into that later when we get into ancient Egypt and we're going to bring the ancient Egyptian history all the way back up to Bavaria and all these indigenous sovereigns right here. Now, on the left we have Friesing Bavaria and on the right we have the Haupts of Pappenheim Bavaria. Okay? Um, we're going to quickly recap the Catholic and Protestant Moorish nobility of Europa. Okay? First, we're going to just quickly uh, go into sovereignty, what is rooted in. It's actually rooted in the indigenous bloodline. All of us have indigenous blood within us and are inherently nobility. Okay? Nadine is a queen. You are a, a you was a, you were, you, like I said yesterday, you have to live like a king because you was raised like a prince. Okay? Same thing with me. I come from a very strong woman and uh, I felt noble. I just felt noble from a, from a child because of all the love that was surrounding me from my mother, from my grandmother. And it was, it was so befitting that she was here to start off this whole um, this whole uh, event that we've ha we're having because the grandmother, not just the mother, but the grandmother 
in all the ancient indigenous traditions, she plays a very, very special role. Now, in synchronicity, if we're going to talk about, uh, like we just got a new black president in the United States, and his name is, uh, of course, everybody knows Barack Obama. His father is from Kenya, and what I did was start to pay a lot of attention to Kenya because in my, I always look at things that happen at, at key times. They're showing you a synchronicity on a higher dimension. Kenya, by the Kenyan people, is called Lao, and it means in Kenya, the land of the widowed grandmother. Now, most of us, uh, now to me, I would think that that's very important to us to pay attention to a lot of the different, and also in Kenya, the grandmother is in charge of telling stories um, that basically uh, for, you know, as far back as they can remember, the grandmother was the one who was like the griot and ca uh, carried on the oral tradition of the nation. And there's a story, there's a few stories that I found very interesting when I studied the Kenyan people. One was a story about Opondo. Opondo was a noble who him and his wife kept giving birth to reptilian children. And when they first saw the reptilian babies, they would just kill all of the babies. And um, finally the wife said, we can't keep killing these babies. So she persuaded her husband to keep one of the reptilian children. And they loved the, the reptilian child just like they would a normal child. And as he grew into adolescence, he would go out to the lake by himself and bathe himself. One day, one of the people from the village snuck out and peeped through the woods and saw him bathing, and he had shed all the reptilian skin, and he was a normal person underneath the reptilian skin. So he ran back and told Opondo. Now, Opondo, he grabbed his wife, they ran out to the lake, and they was like, oh my goodness, the child is normal. And they felt bad because they, they said, wow, we shouldn't have killed all these other reptilian babies. They were normal too. All we had to do was love them. And um, so they realized that, you know, their love was transformative. Now, one thing I always tell people is that whatever you hate is only an aspect of your own self that you hate. Because you become what you hate or you hate what you've become. Now, if you love something, on the other hand, it becomes you. So, love is very powerful, very transformative. Another interesting synchronicity with Kenya and Obama being from Kenya, um, because in my research, I found that everyone in Kenya, last name starts with an O. Like I just told you about Opondo. Right? Everyone in Kenya's last name starts with an O. The O is symbolic of the sun disk, or Ra, or Aten, and is very uh, significant with indigenous people. Thank you, my brother. Let me just breeze through this real quick, because I don't want to get sidestepped. Now, sovereignty is the basis for nobility. For all, all those that don't know, okay, sovereignty is exclusive right to have complete control over an area of governance, people, or oneself. A sovereign is the supreme law-making authority subject to no other. Okay? Um, it says, uh, where's that? A sovereign, national sovereignty is of an eternal origin such as nature or a god legitimating the divine right of kings and absolute monarchs or a theocracy. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna run through this quickly because I just wanna give you our foundation for when we move into this next segment. Now we're gonna deal with the Holy Roman Empire versus the Roman Empire. Uh, this is the coat of arms of the Holy Roman Empire. This is kind of a variation that I have on here of the two um, phoenixes or, you know, you can call them um, uh, 
Falcons if you want, Phoenixes. It looks like Phoenixes to me. But this right here is interesting. This is from Old Navy. And And as you'll see, the Holy Roman Empire is in fact the Old Navy, or the Old Maritime Law, which Admiralty is under that jurisdiction. Now in school, we're taught about the Roman Empire, but we're never taught about the Holy Roman Empire. The Roman Empire we're taught about in school was actually not an empire, it was a republic or a nation state. We have been dumbed down over, over the centuries into not being able to discern the difference between what is a nation state and what's an empire. There are no more empires, okay, or dominions. There are only nation states at the present. Although you had George Bush acting like the United States was an empire, um, it's really just a nation state. <laughs> and um, even in England, where they still have the monarchs, uh, England is not uh, an empire any, anymore, okay? Now, an empire, by definition, means a coalition of sovereign monarchs. Now, since sovereignty is rooted in the indigenous people, in all of us, and since we're all inherently noble, um, we all are inherently kings and queens in our own right. And we all have uh, uh, nobility inherent within us. So uh, the way the Holy Roman Empire was established, it was basically the ancient Germanic tribes would get together and elect a emperor, right? Because kings come together to elect an emperor. Regular people don't elect em emperors, or regular persons, I should say. So all of the sovereign indigenous people would come together and elect an emperor to govern the Holy Roman Empire. Now, um, again, it wasn't hereditary in the sense that if I die, my son becomes the emperor. Every one of us will have a chance to become an emperor at some time or another, okay? Because we are all inherently noble because again, I wanna emphasize that nobility is rooted in the indigenous bloodline and we being indigenous people are all inherently nobility, okay? Now in the territory of the Holy Roman Empire, and remember if you're doing some research, one simple word will open up all types of doors for you, and that's the word holy. Because in school, we're taught about a Roman Empire which really wasn't an empire at all. It was a nation state that got out of control and eventually it had to be put in check by sovereign nobles who are the only people that can put a uh, out of control nation state in, in check because it derives its power from sovereign nobles. It is charted from sovereign nobles. If you do your research on the United States, you'll find that it was originally charted by the indigenous sovereigns of North America, our ancestors. The same thing over here. These nation states eventually got out of control. In fact, there was a, a, a simultaneous destabilization of an indigenous sovereign network that was global. The same time you had the German Revolution, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, all of these things are happening basically simultaneously because they're the destabilization of an indigenous network of aboriginal people who are the true kings and queens of the planet because it's based on our blood connection to the land masses. Now the empire extended present day Germany, which it was actually rooted here, right here in Bavaria where we're at, is the seat of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, it spanned from Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Lexington, Luxembourg, Czech Republic, Slovenia, Belgium, and the Netherlands, as well as large parts of modern Poland, France, and Italy. All right, for much of the empire's history, it consisted of hundreds of smaller kingdoms, principalities, duchies, counties, free imperial cities, and other domains. Despite its name, the Holy Roman Empire, 
never included Rome within its borders. So the Rome that you, that you know of in Italy was a nation state that paid tributary to the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, nation states originally all paid tributary, and I guess that's why they got out of control. They didn't want to pay tributaries anymore. So, uh, they eventually, actually the destabilization took place as a result of a lot of inward fighting amongst nobles, but also intermarrying with people outside of the indigenous bloodline was definitely a major part of the destabilization. Now, the Roman Empire, originally, if you just do your research, you, you'll realize that it was a republic, and after 500 years, Julius Caesar appointed himself the first perpetual dictator. Now, um, uh, once he, have you ever, has anybody ever saw the movie Gladiator? Yeah. Okay, well in the movie Gladiator, where Russell Crowe um, is playing the head of the uh, Roman army, the Roman Republic's army out of Italy, they're attacking the old tribes of Bavaria, which is actually a group of indigenous black people who lived right here in Bavaria. This was the seat of their empire. And Russell Crowe attacks them and defeats them. They're also known as the Huns. If you ever hear about the Huns, Attila the Hun, um, these are all the indigenous black people that were originally right here in Bavaria. Now in the movie, Russell Crowe, after he defeats the Huns, Caesar is standing off to the side and he's having a change of hearts because he's about to die and a lot of times when you're about to die you want to make amends for all your, um, your wrong deeds and everything and balance out your accounts. So he felt bad because he had just overthrown the people who had chartered him to do business and he was about to die so he wanted to make amends, so he told Russell Crowe, look, we're going to have to stop this. As a matter of fact, we got to revert back to a republic immediately. The whole movie Gladiator is about the Roman Empire, really the republic, reverting back to a republic because it was out of control, and Caesar at that time realized it because they had just overthrown the old tribes of Bavaria, who are also, AKA, the Holy Roman Empire, okay? The sovereign monarchs who they paid their tributaries to, they had overthrown them, and his son, of course, didn't want that. He wanted to inherit uh, total dictatorship over Rome, the Roman Republic, so he killed his father himself. And that's the kind of inherent uh, uh, nonsense that goes on when you're dealing with uh, corruption and imbalance. Your own children, you know, can be the end of you. Now, if you Google coat of arms of the Holy Roman Empire, just like that, in Wikipedia, you'll see a question mark because there is no coat of arms for the Holy Roman, I mean, for the Roman Empire. It's a republic. We just have been taught, because they throw words around very loosely, um, that the Roman Republic was an empire. In fact, it was not. It had a flag, but of course it didn't have a coat of arms because this is a sovereign instrument used for conveyance of law. A coat of arms is abbreviated a coat of armor in mail. It's actually used for conveyance of post. Postage is actually the law. As long as you can prove someone has re received post from you, that becomes the standing law. So when you send a piece of mail, if you send it notarized, return receipt mail, so you have proof that they received it, that's law. The judge in the courtroom is just a referee. It's like a game of basketball. The referee can't say nothing unless somebody make a foul because you're on a court. And all contracts are essentially a private affair. They only can become public if you want them to be public. So there is no contest between the Holy Roman Empire and the Roman Empire because one, we know, is a sovereign body which charted this here. So this is uh, a nation state. This is limited liability, by the way. Corporations are limited liability, all right? 
flesh and blood people are 100% responsible for their actions. And this is why nation states have to be kept in check because they're limited liability and if they start wilding out, there's nothing to, to check them. Now, Constantine, I mean, uh, well, after Constantine was defeated, Charlemagne took to court uh, Constantine and any of the other dictators who claimed inherent, inherent nobility to Roman descendancy because the true Roman, Holy Roman Empire was actually seated right here in Bavaria. And they took lawful means to stop people from claiming descendancy to any seat of nobility. This is the flag of the Byzantine em Empire, which was basically the last stage of the Holy Roman Empire, I mean of the Roman Republic, when it was under Constantine's rule. Now, I don't mean to confuse you, but remember, Holy Roman Empire, indigenous sovereign Moors out of Bavaria, Roman Empire, really Roman Republic, corporate nation state out of Italy. One paying tributary to the other one because it was charted. Now we're going to get to the meat and potatoes. Bavaria is the center of the Holy Roman Empire or the indigenous black sovereign nobles of Europe. This is the mighty Vesta Citadel, one of Europe's largest and most grandest palaces. This is right here in Coburg, Bavaria. I was talking to my brother earlier. He told me this is where most of their administrative law in Bavaria comes from here. Um, it would only make sense because during the time of the Holy Roman Empire, this was the seat of the Holy Roman Empire, of all the indigenous sovereigns of Europe. So they started out here and then they branched out. This palace is also the home of the Windsors of England. This is the real home of the Windsors of England. They left here, right here in Bavaria, because they had to marry into the black bloodlines first and usurped their power and then they moved out to where my brother D is from, London, okay? And then they changed their name from Coburg to Windsor in 1917. Prior to 1917, what we call the House of Windsor was really the house of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha with its capital in Coburg, Bavaria. Okay, now in 1914, they, ch they changed their name to Co uh, Windsor uh, for, I, I would call it marketing or publicity purposes. Mm -hmm. They had just started World War I and they didn't want the, they didn't want the people of England to start an uprising because England was at war with Germany and they were a German royal house ruling England at the time. So it didn't make sense and that's really the Illuminati question coming into play straddling both sides of the fence. And when? Creating problems and then coming with the so-called solutions. solutions yeah. Okay. Um, this is the coat of arms of Coburg, Bavaria. Right now. This is not an old coat. Of, well, it is an old coat of arms. Um, and it's actually over a thousand years old. It's not new, I should say. And it has never been changed. Even when the House of Wetton, or the family line of Wetton, I should say, married into the Coburg line. The present House of Windsor, they will tell you that they married into this, into this black family line through the name of Wetton. Okay? So, the Windsors in England, this is their, this is their family crest, or their claim to noble or nobility. Okay? And they are actually the Wettons who married into this line at a time when there were no more male heirs because male heirs are key in nobility. And I'm not taking nothing away from the, 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 the uh, women, but essentially when you're dealing with, uh, when, you, when you consider DNA, um, the mitochondrial DNA, which comes from the woman, uh, takes a snapshot of the past. So it's always looking back to take a snapshot. Remember in Sodom and Gomorrah when they said don't look back and she looked back? Mm -hmm. That's because the feminine principle essentially is always taking a look back to just 
take a snapshot of the past. So that's how you can trace your lineage through your mother. Okay? This is why the lineage is actually carried from the mother to the daughter in terms of tracing ancestry back. So what you're doing, Lord, is helping to continue her mitochondrial DNA. If you have a sister, she's continuing your mitochondrial DNA. You understand? Because the, the, the woman is taking a snapshot of the past, and that snapshot she's taking is never changing. So the same one that your mother saw, your sister saw, that the, that's how you can trace it back. It's an unchanged uh, 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 part of your DNA. But the male is the catalyst forward. So while the woman is taking a snapshot back here, the male is propelling us forward into the new, uh, to the next paradigm. So that's why male heirs were always coveted in noble families. Of course, this is the present House of Windsor's coat of arms, but remember, from 1917, prior to 1917, there was no history on the House of Windsor because it's a new name uh, made up during World War, World War I when they didn't want the people to start an uprising. And what they did was they made it retroactive. So, for example, there was a book written by Shakespeare called The Merry Wives of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. Well, when they changed their name in 1917, they changed the Shakespeare book to The Merry Wives of Windsor. Even though it was a book written over 100 years prior, they made it retro. And this is why when we do our research, we have to pay attention to the time when something is written because that's the context it is in. This is the coat of arms of Saxe Coburg Gotha prior to 1917. And as you can see, it's a Moorish coat of arms with Moorish colors in it, red, black, and green. Now, in nobility, lions and dragons are prominent in all the heraldry or the coats of arms. That's because the lion has a connection with the sun, okay? And dragons also have a connection with the sun. Here you almost see like a, a, a lion type of dragon. And one of our ancient names was uh, Naga, which means dragon, because we, can, we have the ability to uh, contain large amounts of heat. And we're going to get to some really good things concerning that in a minute. Okay. This is the House of Wetton marrying into Coburg. Um, Coburg was also... Uh, the place where Charles Edward, Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, ended up arrested and tried as a Nazi because when you do your research, you find that they had to usurp the indigenous Moorish nobles here in Bavaria first, and then they implemented a, a process of destabilizing the rest of the global network that was there, and they uh, created what's known as the Illuminati, which is an offshoot of the indigenous sovereign Moors that were here as well. And, and so much as that all the ideas of central banking are all part of the indigenous people that was here. Central banking and all these different, uh, you know, put it like this, the desire to rule the planet as one world government with the United States as a hub is actually an ancient idea already done by the indigenous people and they're just trying to do everything you did over again. And they, they actually hide a lot of your history in the United States because that was your hub. Now, uh, he was arrested and tried as a Nazi and that's when they began to try to distance themselves. Well, they had uh, they had started the process, but they really started to remove themselves from that name as far as the public is concerned because it was associated with the Nazis who were actually financed by the House of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. And from 1826 to 1918, Coburg was one of the two capitals of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. It was actually the largest capital. And 
All the royal ducal weddings that unified all of the royal houses of Europe took place at this palace in Coburg. This is why that palace is very, very important. Okay, all of the palaces were built on high uh, mount mountains and high altitudes, and they all looked down over the city. Um, it was it was actually a practice of ours to build all of our palaces on, at high altitudes, and one of the reasons why we picked Bavaria as the central hub of the indigenous black people when we first settled here is because of the high Alps and the high altitudes that are here in Bavaria. Now, there's a district in Bavaria called Garmisch Bavaria, which is the highest point in Bavaria, and that uh, municipality still has a Moorish coat of arms to this day as well. All of these coats of arms are still intact. Okay, Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha was the only European country to appoint a diplomatic consul to the Confederate States of America during the American Civil War. The council name was Ernest Raven assigned to a position in the state of Texas. Raven applied to the Confederate government for a diplomatic Ecuador on July 30th, 1861 and was accepted. Now, uh, again, Saxe, Coburg, Coburg, and Gotha was the only uh, state to appoint a diplomatic consul when there was a fight over slavery because they wanted to perpetuate slavery. Now, remember that their family is not only here in Bavaria, but they have also already positioned themselves in England as the Royal House of England. So they're playing two sides of the fence here. In the movie um, National Treasure 2, when they're talking about the Olmec uh, legacy, and they're talking about the Olmec goal that they're looking for, they speak about Queen Elizabeth having something to do with the Confederate Army, contrary to historical records and historical accounts. This is actually what they were hinting to, was the fact that Queen Victoria, being really a German family, was playing both sides of the fence and doing it through Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha, where she was really raised at. Okay, Henry the Black, this is one of the Holy Roman Emperors, um, who ruled right here out of Bavaria. And uh, here they say black means pious, which is kind of interesting because we never see that anywhere, that black means pious. Okay, this is Henry the Black Duke of Bavaria. This is about 100 years later. He's um, one of the more well-known dukes of Bavaria because of his... Um, his son-in-law, Lothair, who he chose over his other son-in-law, and it's a really, uh, it's kind of like a, a complex story over trying to um, trying to take care of his daughter at the expense of his son, because his daughter was going to marry Lothair. Okay, Coburg, Bavaria. And the palace at Coburg is also where Martin Luther started the German Revo Reformation. That's why it's so very important um, in really getting a grasp on historical events that, you know, have a reverberating effect around the whole world. And history that's important to everyone around the world. Um, so uh, Martin Luther posted his 99 thesis right on the palace walls at Coburg. And again, this is Coburg's family crest right now. And that's because there was a, a, a process of destabilizing a network of indigenous sovereigns. This is Pappenheim, Bavaria. Uh, this is the coat of arms of Pappenheim, Bavaria right now. This is also over a thousand years old. Um, Pappenheim was considered the seat of the hereditary imperial marshals of the Holy Roman Empire. So this was the army that went out and took care of whatever business we had to take care. Now, if you do any research on the Crusades, you'll see that all of the field marshals are named Pappenheim because it was a hereditary seat, as is no nobility. Nobility is rooted in bloodline, so it's all based on hereditary um, blood, okay? Pappenheim comes from the word uh, Papo or Pippin, which means father. 
and or elder and um, he defeated the Alamani tribe. What you must remember is that all of these tribes are, were all black and there was a lot of inward fighting amongst us and again our our problem has been inward fighting amongst each other. If we can stop that we good to go because no one can really um, defeat us without our help and you know all wars have always been fought with our help by our so-called adversaries now this is Fus in Bavaria this is where one of the largest and most well-preserved gothic palaces is and it's still um, in, in very good shape this is Friesing Bavaria. This was the seat of the Archdiocese of the Holy Roman Empire. This was like the original Vatican. Now, Friesing Bavaria is where the original Pope, I mean, where the Pope, that's the Pope now, uh, Pope Benedict. That's where he's from? This is where, he's, this is where he was the cardinal at before he was made uh, the present Pope. Now, the man on the picture is actually the founder of Friesing Bavaria, a brother named St. Corbinius. Now, St. Corbinius um, has a really interesting story because he was traveling through the Alps and a, a pack of wild bears attacked his horse. He, made, he subdued the bears and made one of the bears carry his luggage and him over the Alps. Um, I guess he was on his way maybe to Garmisch, Bavaria, which is the highest municipality in the Alps, also a Moorish municipality. Um, but as you can see in his coat of arms when he was cardinal, he had a depiction of Corbinius, as well as his press coat of arms. As we know, he was a Nazi youth, which you can't fault him for because all the youth in Germany at that time was a Nazi youth. Okay? But he did say some kind of rather provocative things towards Islam, which had me kind of w w wonder about him. This is another um, version of his, coat of his present coat of arms as Pope. And of course, he has St. Corbinius in the coats of arms and, and you know you hear people talking about it and they don't really understand what they're saying and they're like why does he have a, a black man in his coat of arms but a little bit of research we in the information age you'll find that this man is the founder of course of Friesing Bavaria because all of these municipalities were part of the Holy Roman Empire or the empire of indigenous sovereign Moors who existed right here in Bavaria but what they're doing now is mixing truth with falsehood because since he was the cardinal of the true seat of the archdiocese of the indigenous empire, they now have made him the pope of the artifice or the, the republic which never was included within the borders. Okay? Um, we're going to just breeze through some of this because I want to get to the to some of the new stuff. This is pretty much a recap. Napoleon again, um, he, he was a, a descendant of indigenous people as well. All these people in Cisa nobility had to marry into uh, indigenous bloodlines in order to assert their ascension to the throne. This is Pastet in Bavaria. And all of these, in doing my research, I found that when they originally came here in around the second century, there was a lot of fighting, and they were not established strong until after the Roman Republic was shut down, because when they first charted the Roman Republic, they were not fully together as one nation. So the Roman Republic was able to get away with a lot of stuff. In fact, you know, after a while they came and attacked them and defeated them. It was not until Islamic nobles came to their aid and helped them defeat the Roman Republic that they were reestablished as the Holy Roman Empire. And of course that would let us know that there was never a conflict between Islamic nobility and Catholic and Protestant nobility. Even though we have been taught that there was, you know, the Muslims came in and did all this stuff and all of that, all, in all actuality, what they've been trying to do is conceal the fact that the original Catholic and Protestant nobility is Moorish as well, and there was no conflict. In fact, they helped one another all along. This is Garmisch, Bavaria. 
This is the highest mountain of Germany. And this is still the coat of arms to this day. Again, in Bavaria is where you find all of the coats of arms intact for these municipalities. Okay, uh, Ali Walid Muhammad Avaros, this was a brother who basically uh, was plagiarized and he gave them a lot of um, literature on Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Um, what you got to remember is a lot of the stuff that you were taught in school, like the Pythagorean theorem, these things you're taught using Arabic numerals. So they're teaching you so-called Roman mathematics, but they're teaching you them with Arabic numerals. You can't do complex mathematical equations with Roman numerals. It's impossible. Um, the history has really been distorted, but it's not too hard to put together if you just open your eyes and, like the brother Rashid said, admit that you've been lied to and then challenge yourself to discern from what you can do the knowledge to and you, you know, you make it your truth. You shape and mold and create yourself because Atam or Atan, the complete one means the self-created one as well. So if you're not creating yourself, you will never be complete. Okay? This is the coronation mantle of the Holy Roman Emperors. So whenever a Holy Roman Emperor would take office, he would do a ceremony with this robe. The interesting thing about this robe is that it was actually made by Arabic artisans um, for, the Normandy, for the Norman kings. And um, again, contrary to popular opinion, there was no conflict because the Islamic Moors or the Islamic nobles were the one who shut down the Roman Republic when it got out of hand in regards to the Catholic and Protestant nobility. Now we're going to, oh this is the Ottoman Empire, these are the brothers that shut down the Roman Republic. Yeah. This is the, this, this is the empire that shut down the Roman Republic when it got out of hand and they basically helped to reestablish the Catholic and Protestant um, black nobility that was seated right here in Bavaria. Oh, they look like pirates. Um, well, they are, they was, you know, I, I spoke to a brother again. These was actually the pirates of the Caribbean. They ruled the seas, you know, and they were traveling back and forth over here, even though that kind of history has been suppressed, it's still there. So, I'm just giving you some things to spark you so you can do some research and validate this information for yourself. This is Osman Kara Bey, the chief sovereign of the Ottoman Empire at that time. Now, Kara in Turkish means black. So his name is really Osman Black Bey or Osman the Black Bey, chief sovereign of the Ottoman Empire. Now, Bey is a Turkish word for chieftain, and many Moors using the, the word Bey don't realize that the first Beys were of the Ottoman Empire who are also part of our history, but they've suppressed that or separated that by having us think that the Ottomans have nothing to do with the Islamic Moors from Spain or the Catholic and Protestant Moors from right here in Bavaria and so forth and so on. But it's one global network and it's actually one family. Okay? Salim and Suleiman, they had uh, enjoyed victories all throughout Europe in reestablishing the indigenous people and rescuing indigenous people from the hands of um, the inquisitionists and so forth like that. This is a crown of Ivan Bosky, also made by uh, Islamic sovereigns for their Catholic and Protestant uh, brothers who were nob nobility as well. There was never a conflict between Islam and Christianity or Judaism because the Bible and the Quran basically are talking about the same people and the same history, the, the history of the oldest family on the planet, which is our family. Okay, um, this was Muhammad, this is Muhammad II who started the modernization of Turkey and basically um, he incorporated more European styles of clothing, agriculture and innovations and abandoned because Again, we were intermarrying with people other than our own bloodline. So it was a lot of our own undoing as well. 
Okay, let's just move through here. Now we all know, again, that the Illuminati has its origins right here in Bavaria through Adam, Adam Weishaupt. Well, what you don't know is that Adam Weishaupt is also a descendant of black people. He married into black blood as well. Um, the first family crest I showed at the, at the top of the lecture was actually a Haupt crest, and he's a descendant of the Haupts. Okay, now, everybody knows that the Illuminati is basically a plot to overthrow the so-called kings and queens of Europe and the world. Well, when you read the uh, Cosmic Trigger, you find that the nobility of Europe is actually behind the Illuminati, so it's, they can't be trying to uh, undermine their own positions. They're actually trying to perpetuate something that's taken place a long time ago, which was the destabilization of the indigenous sovereign monarchs of Europe. Okay, that's the Haupt uh, coat of arms again, which is where Adam Weishaupt is a descendant of. Even the Rothschilds, okay, Rothschild meaning Red Shield, are descendants of black people, and they all claim um, descendants from uh, these black nobles who are um, the true indigenous people of this land. Now, this is the oldest Haupt crest. This is a more modern Haupt crest. As you can see, indigenous, aboriginal, as is all the family crests of the nobility in Europe. Now we're going to just, um, does anybody have a question about uh, the, the uh, Moorish nobility of Europe and being centered in Bavaria before I move on to the next segment? Okay. Okay, I got a question. Okay. The family crest, um, when I looked at my last name Hart, you know, it went all the way back to Germany. Uh -huh. and the family crest was uh, red and blue, mm -hmm. and it had like a, a white lion and a white, looked like a stallion or something like that. Mm. What do you think it means? Well, the lion again, um, nobility is connected with the sun. This is what I'm about to get into now. Um, the lion is connected with the sun. Um, because um, the sun was said to be, you know, uh, like the, you know, the, the, the constellation that, the sun is represented by Leo, right? Yes. And uh, the horse, right, is also connected with nobility because the horse is connected to the number seven, okay? <laughs> um, if you play chess, for example, you know how to play chess? Yeah, intermediate. Intermediate. What's the move that the horse makes? The horse makes L. L is an upside down seven, right? A L is a seven, and you could say the horse makes a seven or L, and that's why God is also, uh, in ancient times, referred to as L, you know? So you say L, or you say seven, right? If you study the Chinese zodiac, you'll find that the seventh zodiac is the horse. Because all these things were basically created by the same ancient Egyptian priest. Now, that last lecture, now we're going to get into ancient Egypt. And we're going we're gonna to work our way from ancient Egypt on up to the modern uh, paradigm. True. Just before we move on, what I wanted to ask, you see on, on a lot of the coats of arms there, you've got like um, very deliberate depictions with the features, the red lips and so forth, the curly hair. Um, what we've got in Europe, I don't know if it's in the States, like the Gollywood character. Well, what they do is, you know, they um, make a mockery of it by, you know, um, put it like this. In ancient Egypt, the hieroglyph for heaven is a face with big lips and a big nose. So big lips and a big nose was considered heavenly by indigenous people. So when we drew big lips and big nose, we weren't mocking ourselves, just like when you look at the old chocolates that were from that era, right? They had pictures of Moors with exaggerated features because when you see some of the old statues, you'll see that our most ancient ancestors had big, big lips, big, big noses, strong features, dominant features, and they were considered heavenly. When you write the, the word Haru in hieroglyphics, 
you write it with a, 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 a flak rope, which is symbolic of the DNA, next to the face with the big lips and the big nose. With more, and they, this is how they accent it. They write the face with the big lips and the big nose, and then they put more big lips under the face, right? Just to accent it, like, yeah, you know? And then they put the birds uh, that are symbolized for Haru on the side. But um, that's because our features, again, are considered heavenly. Why I was stressing that is because one, there's like a big campaign in the UK because, well, even up to now in um, Cornwall on the 26th of December every year, the whole town in Cornwall, this particular town, they dress up in blackface, put on the big wigs, paint up their lips, and basically up in love of our people in the UK being like, look, how is this still going on? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no. But, but they're not dissing you. Well, this is what I know. This is what I mean. They're celebrating your history That's right. That's right. in a way that, you know, that you, you're, you're not even aware of it. And the same thing in Holland. I went to Amsterdam two years ago and during the Christmas period, everywhere you went, they've got them in the windows, the people dress up as them. I mean, I've taken snaps everywhere that I went, but you see it and I said the mm -hmm. same thing. I know that this is, once you know the story. Once you know the history, yeah. you realize that, yeah, they know, they know. All of these municipalities have our, our print all over it. It's actually called Darky Day. That's what they call it in, in the UK, Darky Day. Darky Day. Well, it's interesting because today is the, the, the dead Sunday. It's Darky Day. Darky Day right now. You know, what's interesting though, look, check this out. They say that the center of the universe is right between Sagittarius and Scorpio. Right? Has anybody ever heard that? Well, they say that the center of the universe or the, um, uh, the, um, the photon belt is right around the middle of Saturn and Scorpio. And that's where we are right now, in the middle of Saturn and Scorpio. I mean, uh, Sagittarius and Scorpio. We're leaving Scorpio and entering Sagittarius. So this is a, this is a, a, a special time that, you know, uh, is commemorated not only here in Bavaria, but I guess all around the universe, you know? So everything is in synchronicity. And again, synchronicity is our opportunity to um, go through a wormhole, so to speak, and enjoy a hyper-dimensional uh, perspective of something because nothing happens by chance. Everything that's lined up is showing you something because synchronicity is hyperdimensional perception. I just wanted to add on real quick. Since we're moving into the Aquarian age, it was befitting to bring the Aquarius here to set off the energy Indeed. around the whole thing. Mother Goddess is an Aquarius. Mm -hmm. So she had to come and she had to be the first one. Absolutely. So she's ushering in. She's ushering in a whole new age. You understand? And that's. See that battery pack real quick. Okay. Let's put a fresh one in there. Keep ourselves fresh. But what we must remember. Is the the physical age that we're in is only. That which is dealing with the physical form. The polar opposite, because when you see a sign, poles, right? Everything has a polar opposite. Physical form, right? But to be whole and complete, we have to also consider the polar opposite of that. The ancient Egyptian priests, right, would when they got out of control, when the priesthood was really, because the priesthood got corrupt for a while, and what the priesthood would do is they would keep uh, information from the masses. They would have the people worshiping the age and keep the fact from them that they were worshiping the totality of the, of the energy by honoring the other half, you know? So like with the Piscean age, which was the Christ age, 
the other half of that is Virgo. Neptus. You know what I'm saying? That which is suckling. So he's sitting on her lap. You get it? Being suckled. But that's for a time because that's his polar balance. Virgo gives birth to the sun. You get it? So that's, that's how that story is together. So we, to get the whole story... That I spoke about mm -hmm. is Mercury. It's ruled by Mercury. Yeah, just like Virgo. Is Virgo is ruled. I'm telling you, Virgo is Neptali. It is. It is. In ancient Egypt. Mm. So this is why we got to go back to ancient Egypt because this is going to show us why the sun is so important. Because we were talking about the simplicity of technology. And the most simplest technology is the sun technology. That's the simplest technology out, Jay. You go right out in the sun, you're good. You know? You go out in the sun, you good money. Even when we're asleep and our, and our DNA is not fully activated, we can still get nutrients from the sun, like vitamin D, you know? Um, but we can also, when we heighten our um, activity of our DNA, we can get all of the energy and nutrients we need. In fact, we photosynthesize just like plants. We photosynthesize just like plants. Um, and the sun is symbolic of the completeness of the creative force. It was said in ancient Egypt that Ra, the creator, made the sun in this dimension for him to dwell in, in his totality. You know what I'm saying? It's his house. That's his house. You know what I'm saying? So he made the sun for him to dwell in, and that's where the, the uni unification comes in. One of our reasons for falling is because as we fragmented ourselves or fragmented the creative force, we became fragmented. So um, it all relates. Okay, this is, um, again, we just, this is called the return of the solar kings because uh, in my research I found that the solar wind or shoe um, is of the utmost importance in understanding nobility and unlocking a lot of the keys um, and, and, the, and the hidden mysteries that has been in people's face all along but they haven't been able to quite grasp it. Um, let's go on. This is the outline for the lecture. Ancient Kemet, Kepra, Ra, and Atta. At night, he's in his boat, sailing across the sky, nut. But he's resting. As I said earlier, even the Creator principle rests. You know, seven day he rests, took a break. I'm just going to rest for a minute. And so, again, we get caught up with the physical form, and we don't realize that the sun, we're, we're doing the moving. You know what I'm saying? The sun is staying right there, but it appears that the sun is rising and setting. But in all actuality, we're moving. Now, our ancestors knew that, but they made stories like this to reconcile and balance out things. Because we are, we're, we're right now in the physical form. Okay, so we're going to start off with the original form of the creator principle in ancient Kemet. I like to call it the father, the father principle. We're going to um, take a look at Akhenaten. We're going to do some interesting comparisons to Moses in the Exodus. But here we're gonna we're gonna find that there's tremendous information linking the Exodus of Moses uh, Just give them a little minute to do what they're doing. So that's an ottoman right there. Ottoman, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's yeah. ottoman right there. Right. You got, you got it. You can see. You got it real. You got a chance to see a real ottoman. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> or a descendant of the real Ottomans. What about the other one? Somebody got trouble with it? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> listen, listen, baby. We all one family, one family. Um, so, Akhenaten, right? We're going to find tremendous information linking him to Moses. Some of the first information on the mass scale was Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was the, one of the first more notable people to say that Moses was, if not Akhenaten, one of his priests. Then we're going to deal with the ancient Olmec civilization in America and make some interesting discoveries about the Mormons and the Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints. Because the Mormons actually claim to be descendants of the Olmecs, which is kind of crazy because when you look at the Olmecs and you see their features, and then you look at Mormons and you realize that Mormons are for the most part racists, you wonder how did they ever, you know, get there? What's the connection? This is, this is one of the most amazing parts of this lecture that I, I was able to find, Kalalus. Kalalus is the name of the Jewish Catholic state in early America, which was also called the Roman Empire. <laughs> so this is very interesting. Then we're going to just simply deal with the Son of Man returning because Nobility is uh, the sun, or Aten, his symbol was simply a circle, just like the sun, and, or what they would call a disk. And um, that's because everything is traveling in this path. So no matter where you, where, where you on your way to, you're going to find your, your way right back to where you was at. Because that's the way the energy is flowing, essentially. Okay. This is a form of Atum or Atum Ra or Atum Re. This is um, Kepra, the dung beetle. Okay. And the disc here, Ra. And the original wing disc is also a form of Atum. Okay. The story of creation related in the pyramid text explains that Ra as Atom rose in the beginning of creation as a Benben stone, an obelisk like pillar in the temple of the Banu Phoenix in Heliopolis. He then spit forth Shu and Tefnut, who became the first godly couple and who respectively symbolized air and moisture. To them, Geb and Nut were born, symbolizing the earth and sky. Geb and Nut, in turn, begot two divine couples consisting of Osiris, Isis, Seth, Nephthys, called the Ennead of Gods. The combined attributes of this uh, divine group were needed in order for the world to function. Now, as we see, Ra is the primary or principal creator principle in ancient Kemet. And he goes through stages of creating. First, he creates element, elementals. And then he creates uh, the first gods, all right? Now, what took place in Egypt after a period of time was <clears throat> Ray began to fall to the, to the wayside, and the priests began to get out of control, and they began to put a lot of emphasis on the personalities of the gods. This led to a lot of... Uh, what we were talking about last night, we were, we were relating it to the Tower of Babel because everybody was talking and nobody wasn't understanding nobody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's what happens when everybody starts to um, go off on tangents and basically uh, create, you know, their own, put it like this, uh, Allah is one. Okay, and when you realize that Allah is one, all of the things that you might have been thinking were important like um, uh, rituals and sacrifice, you know, and this is what led to our demise, an overindulgence in ritualistic sacrifice. So 
what happened was Atan fell to the wayside and they began to worship the form of him that was sleeping or the, or the underworld aspect of him. So they, not realizing, were keeping themselves in a dream state and not waking up. Because, again, what we was talking about with the knowledge born, right? Atom created the darkness of space as a womb to birth itself out of. Okay? But you don't get caught up in that, if you get caught up in that, in that darkness, you are in the abyss. It's no, you just in the abyss. You can just go crazy out there for as long as you want. But you have no grounding. You have no solid foundation. Okay? So that's pretty much what happened to ancient Kemet and led to the, you know, the fall of ancient Kemet. But prior to the fall, a brother by the name of Akhenaten and a few other um, uh, pharaohs before him, but it was culminated with him because he led the exodus out. So everyone, he's probably one of the, probably the most famous pharaoh in ancient Egyptian history. And he's known for reestablishing Aten as the principal and taking away a lot of focus with the personalities of the deities. Must go. Okay. <laughs> I'm out again. <laughs> Okay, uh, Ra was the Egyptian sun god who was also often referred to as Ra Harakuti, meaning Ra, Horus of the horizon, referring to the god's character. The early Egyptians believed that he created the world and the rising sun was, for them, the symbol of creation. The daily cycle as the sun rose, then set, only to rise again, and the next morning symbolized renewal, and so Ra was seen as the paramount force of creation and master of life. His closest ally is Ma'at, the embodiment of order and truth. Okay, now the pyramid text, which is the oldest text that they found in Egypt, it predates the coffin text and the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead is what most people are familiar with. It was called the Book of the Dead by Wallace Budge but it's actually called the Book of Coming Forth by Day. Um, and um, it represented the sun coming forth and renewing itself every day. As we renew ourselves every day when we wake up in the morning after we took a, little, a nice little sleep. So again, the sun was seen as the complete aspect of the creative principle and the place where the oneness and totality of, of the creative principle dwelled in this physical dimension that we're in right now. Okay. Um, we find magical papyri from different social strata intending to protect both the living and the dead which relies on solar symbolism. Solar symbolism um, again was used to for protection of those who are uh, alive and those who are dead. The solar principle was um, because it ensured the resurrection, the believer's resurrection. His identification with the son ensured that even though it appeared that he would die, of course he would be renewed again. We also find many amulets, place, amulets placed on the mummies of both royalty and non-royalty to protect the dead. These solar symbols include the sun in the horizon, the sun disk, the celestial bark, the double lion, and the obelisk. There was also a disk showing Ra with four ram's heads, a nocturnal form called uh, hypocephalus. Um, 
Though uh, Ray lived on in various forms into the Greco-Roman period, his worship gradually deteriorated during the first millennium. Remember, after a period of time, the identification of the creative principle with him starts to fall to the side, and we start to identify more with um, his journey through the underworld or the identification of his dead body, which is Osiris. Okay, Ray was also closely connected to the Pharaoh, Egypt, Egypt's king. While the king ruled the earth, Ray was the master of the universe, so they were of the same nature and were in effect a mirror image of each other. Because the principles of sovereignty are actually derived from studying the sun. Nobility is derived from studying the sun. This is why um, uh, like for example I was talking to you about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, right? Because that circle is um, an indicator of the solar principle because as Dot said uh, yesterday, your he the helix of your DNA is spinning at 36 degrees as it ascends. It's the ascension of light. You study Taoism, they talk about 36 breaths in order to raise your kundalini up to your chakra. So it's the ascension of light, okay? Now, um, uh, let's see here. The king or the chief sovereign, again, studied the sun so that it could mirror all the aspects and qualities of the sun. Um, the sun represents the absolute unchanging nature of the creator and the creative principle. And we here experiencing this dimension, right? We are not experiencing the totality of ourselves. This is a, an aspect of ourselves. Okay, so the solar principle was showing us that there is a, to a totality beyond this experience that's projecting this experience. You understand? It's showing you that even though you're experiencing this, you're not going to die when you stop experiencing this. This is a projection, okay, of your solar nature, you know, soul, um, meaning sun in Latin, right? So the people of soul have the solar principle or that eternal, complete um, nature within themselves, essentially. Ra was often lauded as lord of the circle and as he who entereth or liveth in the circle. He was described as the sender forth of light into his circle and as the governor of his circle. Now, again, that's why when I started to see a lot of synchronicities with circles or O's, you know, as in the blood type of indigenous people being O or the circle, which is, a, uh, uh, you know, that's your validation of your nobility, okay? Um, so, again, the indigenous people essentially had the blood type of O, and you will see a lot of synchronicity with O's, for example, the Omex. And the interesting thing about um, the place called Kalalus, or the Roman state of America, when they found all of the documents that were telling the story of this people, they were all signed at the end, O-L. <laughs> <laughs> is that not crazy? They were all signed at the bottom, O-L. So again, when you see an O, it's indicative of the solar principle, and that's why you have 360 degrees of arc within a circle, because it's the, your, your, your um, DNA is spinning at 36 degrees. So it all relates. This painting shows the journey of Ra, the sun god, traveling through the underworld in his solar bark, a journey he undertakes every night, just like you undertake a journey every night. 
you know, because again, you have to rest. Um, and the creative principle rests as well. It's the same thing. It's basically, uh, it's one and the same. And this is why the chief sovereign of the universe was called the sun. Ray's early worship really became very significant during the fifth dynasty when kings not only erected pyramids aligned to the rising and setting sun, but also built solar temples in the honor of Ray. This sort of temple must have been a difficult conception for the Egyptians because Ray never had a sanctuary with a cult statue. See, as we began to get more immersed in ritual, we started making things more elaborate when they used to be very, very simple. We used to worship just outside, outdoors. And then the, the priesthood became so complicated, just like the priesthood now with the Vatican and so forth and so on, that it, was a, a more, it became more of a commercial thing instead of something for the cult uh, spiritual cultivation of the people. Now, uh, by this time, you see a steady deterioration of the completeness of the um, creative principle and it becomes more and more fragmented. Okay, um, at this time, Ra takes on additional attributes by his combination with other gods. This is often seen as a political move to unite important gods of different religions and so we see Ra who was most prominent in the north combined with another creator god, Amun of southern Egypt into Amun-Ra. He was also combined with a number of other gods. Now again, as I said, Egypt is going through a, a serious, serious, uh, I would say, um, fragmentalization of its original um, system of spiritual cultivation. Then we're going to deal with Akhenaten and Moses and the exodus to America. Akhenaten was the pharaoh who reestablished the oneness of the creator principle. And in doing my research, I found this extensive information linking him with the story in the Bible of Moses. So you have a fictitional character based on a real live character, a real live indigenous man right here. Okay, this is the Armana dynasty, uh, the dynasty that culminated with Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti. Everybody's familiar with Nefertiti. Now, um, Akhenaten was also the first pharaoh to incorporate his wife with him in his stele and his children. He got stele with him, his wife, and his children simply sitting under the sun, showing that their unity is the oneness of the creator or the creative principle. There's no separation, there's no fragmentalization, there's uh, plenty stele for the first time you're seeing a whole family together um, and showing love to one another. See how she's uh, affectionately touching him like that? This was never done prior to this on any other stele. Sort of like you see the Obama family together. Right, right. There you go. Right. There you go. Right. Right. And um, could be coincidence, but the 18th letter, and this is why I say Akhenaten's priests are the ones who basically wrote the Bible. They created a lot of languages. They wrote the Quran. Um, I want to say, give a shout out to M. Fudishu. He's a professor of Egyptology in New York as well as in Egypt. Master. Master. And um, he, he gave me a lot of information on ancient Egypt um, for this lecture. Um, but I learned a lot about the Armina dynasty, and he basically showed me that the uh, priests of Akhenaten were the ones who actually created the, the Greco-Roman calendar that we call the Greco-Roman calendar. Those were still Egyptian priests. So Egyptian priests were creating that. They created the Bible. They created the Quran, and they encoded it with the oneness of the creative principle or the creator principle. Um, in the Bible you hear about the, the Babylon, you hear about um, uh, Moses exiting Egypt and it's all related to the, dis the dispute over 
the oneness of the creator versus an out of control priesthood that was, you know, money hungry, control freaks. They wanted to control everybody and they just was on this bugging. So um, there's no coincidence that the 18th letter in the alphabet happens to be R or that 180 degrees is the poles of a 360 degree circle. Because, go ahead. And the 99 attributes of love, you got 99 is 18, so you got, and it coincides with the 18th letter. Mm. And the seal on the Quran is 19, like That's the right. brother was talking about earlier. All the secret ancient mysteries of Quran to actually get into the text and challenge You know why the seal is 19? Because you got to save yourself. Right. Nobody can not save you. Right. And, <laughs> and That's, of course, as we said yesterday, the 18th letter is also Ra Kim. Right? Mm -hmm. With the Ra, you know what I'm saying, again. And, and also, Ra endows people with a fiery drive. Anybody with a Ra for their first, uh, you know, uh, syllable of their name, it could be a woman or a man, <clears throat> you'll notice that they have a very, very fiery disposition, a real, real... You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Um, however, some new kingdom temples were built with an open courtyard with an altar for Ra, where the priest or the, theoretically the king himself would recite one of 12 poetical hymns predicting the victorious course of the sun each hour of the day. That's about by the spelling of hour. In these temples, the rising sun is sometimes depicted as a squatting human infant, while the full daylight sun takes on the form of a human adult. During this period, the king is very directly identified with Ra. Uh, Amenhotep III, for example, called himself the dazzling sun. And it was interesting because this brother told me today that Henry the 14th, Louis the 14th of France, who was the the Moorish noble that was overthrown during the French Revolution was called the Sun King. Because again, nobility, and we're going to link all of these Egyptian priests and their exodus right back to here to Bavaria. Okay, the son of the sun. He adopted on his ascension to the throne. This is uh, Akhenaten, uh, the title high priest of Ra Harakuti, the exalted one of the horizon. His name of Shu, who is in Aten, which is clear proof that he was not only a worshiper of Ra Hermachus, another of the forms of the sun god of Heliopolis, but also that he endorsed the views and held the opinions of the old college of priests at Heliopolis, which assigned the disc Aten to him for a dwelling place. Amenhotep's title as lord of the shrines of the cities of Nekhebet and Orchet, and as the Horus of gold also prove his devotion to a sun god of Heliopolis. The sun also embodied the state of Hetep or balance. Or that which is the only op absolute. Royal, see royal, the word royal is the word real. It's just accented with an accent over the E. So that's saying that the only real thing is that absolute, unchanging, complete wholeness. Everything else is an illusion. So, um, Aten, or the Creator, assigned for himself the sun as a dwelling place. Because that was uh, uh, to embody his unchanging, whole completeness even within this dimension of temporal uh, reality. Okay, now there's too much information to put in one lecture on information showing that the priests of Akhenaten actually wrote the Holy Bible and the Holy Quran. Um, I challenge everyone out there to do just a little bit of research for yourself and you'll see that when they were talking about abandoning idol worship, 
ritualistic sacrifice, if we know that the simplest technology is simple, the best technology is simple, you, we don't have to concern ourselves with complex formula because intent, if you have love, right, that will create the most harmonious and beautiful geometry and it will create synchronicity in your life that will make you understand that the magic of your love needs no, you don't have to check and verify, nothing. It is, you know, it is, it is all encompassing, it's all pervasive. Like you said, it's really the only real thing that exists. So that's why even though we can decode and decipher, we would never be, a, it'll take forever to decipher the kind of geometric formula that would be evidence of love. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's too beautiful and too hard to decipher. They have a, a, a doctor, a, a, a Chinese doctor, who just plays music to ice. And he studies the geometric patterns that the music makes. The hidden messages of water. The hidden messages of water. Yamoto. Yeah. Now, what he did was he showed that if you play music that's beautiful and harmonious, you know, like um, like if you play some really nice classical music, which again is Moorish music, um, you will you will impress upon the ice beautiful geometry in all different kind of elaborate shapes. Um, so again, the simplicity of you know of of just love. You know what I'm saying? Will surpass any kind of formula that you're dealing with, any kind of magical ritual, anything that you're trying to use to manipulate something external to you, right? Is futile without love. In fact, it will hinder you when you think you are about to make progress. <clears throat> That was a so-called message in the Bible when it said that uh, Jesus actually came to preach brotherly love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brotherly love. Because as soon as you, that means is like, that means is you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want no conflict. You don't want no conflict with your brethren. Your brethren are your brethren. And again, like I said, being that love is the only real thing. If you if you preoccupy yourself with ritualistic formula, what you're doing is saying that you need something to sacrifice for energy to harness to make your will manifest. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? This is what we are being dominated with right now. Caucasians are doing rituals on us all day, every day, because we became obsessed with ritual. And therefore, our justice was to be dominated by that same ritual we became obsessed with. You understand? But it's all an illusion. Because like you said, our technology is within our, we, we have everything we need within self, complete wholeness. We don't have to look outside self. I just wanted to, uh, when you were talking about that, and you were talking, and you were talking yesterday about the communication, and I just wanted to re re remind, remind people when you were talking about how they get the drugs and all, we, we're, we're in, in, in to what you're saying, we didn't have to have a telephone. We didn't have to have any kind any of this technology. technology. We were we we were able to we able to communicate the best. We're on our way back there now. I am. The internet, the internet is the first. Yeah, we're all on our way back there. And if you ain't on your way back there, you're not going to make it to that next paradigm because that next paradigm is so unified, Phil, that we don't need no phones. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We don't need no phone. We don't even need no internet. Because the real online is our melanin. It's online, that's right. All we got to do is recalibrate our thinking to a unified field. Because anytime you could perceive conflict, you're going the wrong way. Just turn around and go the other way. For real. But you do that, some, right? It's like your mind. It's, 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 yeah, you just got to go, oh, I'm going the wrong way. I'm going that way because, like she said, the creator wants things to be easy for you. So when you're entertaining difficulty, 
you're going down the wrong path. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're doing it, you're beating yourself in the head. Because the path to your highest self, put it like this, you exist in your highest form already. And the path there, since you exist there, that's where you have the least conflict. So the path there is already paved with the least amount of conflict for you to walk to. So we beat ourselves in the head by walking over there, walking over here, when the easy path is where our higher dimensional self resides anyway. You know what I'm saying? We create in all these difficulties and we don't, we don't have to do it. Now, the ancient Olmec civilization, which we are aware of, again, look at the heavenly features. This is, this is what we call heavenly. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know what? This this brother here traveled to Spain, traveled to uh, 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 um, Ireland. Okay, this is the kind of history that we really didn't know nothing about. The Olmecs, being the ancestors or the nobility here in Bavaria, were actually a uh, a satellite of this empire in ancient America because what took place was actually an exodus out of Egypt through Asia to America and then from America to Bavaria spread out into Europe back over to America but we're doing we're fighting a lot we're fighting amongst each other all along we're on a downward spiral we're moving more and more away from the simplicity of the love of Allah and the oneness, you know what I'm saying, and the unity which is essentially the only thing that's real. And so what we're gonna see is that from here, we went further and further into a, 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 a lower state. Many of us or the priests were trying to maintain the focus on the oneness of, of Allah and of, of everything, because everything is one. And as soon as you can perceive conflict, you're already acknowledging a conflict within self. So the only, you're only fighting yourself. That's why we, we, all, we, all we do is, is just we fight not fighting ourselves. And, you know, it's, it's just a waste of time. Now... <clears throat> Out of the Olmec civilization, we get the Aztec, the Inca, the Toltec, and the Maya. But they have superimposed the wrong people in our psyche concerning these names. Okay? These are all black people who are the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas, who settled the Americas, who um, then started to experiment with a lot of ritualistic sacrifices themselves, some more created more and more confusion for them to go through. And again, we're basically paying karmic debt. Because when our ancient scientists created the other people of the planet, they really created them to be our servants and our slaves. And to worship us. That wasn't a nice thing to do. What happened after that? We end up serving them and worshiping them. So that's why the conflict, you don't want that. We just went through all of that. Wasn't that they were, um, they were saying that, that um, we are too high intellectually and spiritually to actually work for ourselves? So that's why, you know, so that's why they actually created that people? Mm -mm. What they did was they inverted the solar principle into thinking that since we're real and, and this is an artificial dimension, will be the only ones that's real and make a whole bunch of subjects for us. We're the royal nobility, we're the indigenous bloodline, you know, and we can go through 360 degrees of the Earth's changes, so we can get away with anything we want. We can escape our own laws that we have, you know, to govern the universe. No, we can't. These are principles that are can't even, there's, there's no room for any kind of modification on these principles. These are immutable laws. 
There's seven immutable laws. The stuff we're subject to are called codes and, 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 and statutes because they're not laws. Laws are immutable. You can't break them. You break yourself against them. There are seven immutable principles that emanate from the oneness of a law, and they're called the seven hermetic principles. One of them is called cause and effect, and that will get you every time. This is why, you know, you have to maintain balance. Balance was how we validated asserting that we was God in the flesh. We had to keep a balance. We had to deal with equality. Without balance, you know, it's just it's chaos and confusion. So, all these people are indigenous people, but again, uh, we have been embossed in our psyche with people other than who these people really are just to conceal a lot of this history while at the same time the people who are doing it are trying to claim the history for themselves. Okay? Now again, as we, we have to clean up our karmic debt right now. Now while we do it, because we're the principles, all those people, all the other races have a chance to clean up their karmic debt. It's up to them. But, you know, nobody can't speak for nobody. On, you know what I'm saying? On that day, then you gotta you gotta be accountable for your own actions, and you really judge your own self. Okay, this is an Inca mummy. Um, I had to blow this up uh, on, on, on my screen. You can see the face a little bit. This is a very dark skinned woman, and she has dreads actually. But since this is black, you can't really see the dreadlocks right there. Okay, the Peruvians believe that the sun was at once the ancestor and the founder of the Inca dynasty, and that the Incas reigned as his representatives and almost in his person. The son, therefore, was the sovereign lord of the world, the king of heaven and earth, and was called by them Inti, which signifies light. Okay, this is an Olmec child. Um, again, notice the heavenly features. These are the ancient black civilizations of Central America. Uh, they are the Book of Mormon calls them the Jaredites. And if you, if you just do any research on the Book of Mormon, you're going to be blown away because their whole literature is based off of a guy named Smith, Joseph Smith, who found some tablets and translated the tablets and came up with the history of the oldest people on the planet who allegedly had were part of the exodus out of Egypt here, okay? This also is synchronistically linked with the Washita Moors, who we know are black people, because we know plenty of Washita Moors, any of us who have been um, in, the, in the conscious community for a while, and um, we have all been um, redeeming our Moorish history. This is what we're here to do today. Um, there are Moors like Empress Verdesi of the Washington tribe who will also tell you that they were part of Moses' mass exodus. That's what they tell you. We were part of Moses' mass exodus and we are descendants of the Olmecs. We've always been in America. They never brought us over here as slaves and we know our history. Well, what's interesting is Joseph Smith says the same thing. He said, I found these tablets and since I found them, and I deciphered them, this is my lineage, and all my people, this is our lineage. But they're racist, and they actually claim that these are their ancestors, which is ludicrous. Okay? Um, they have a book called The Book of Ether, and it's about the Jaredite, or the Omex. History from the Tower of Babel through China, again, through Asia, to their coming to the Central America and their eventual fall. Their eventual fall, if you read the Book of Mormons, they'll tell you that the Jaredites, who are the Toltecs, and the um, Aztecs basically fought each other until... Yeah. It's over? No, I'm going to... Until they was... Um, completely in ruins. They did it to themselves. Okay, it's interesting that it's called the Book of Ether because 
we all know that the ether being the fifth element is symbolic of the dodecahedron as well as we know we call our hair non-ether hair. Okay? And the Jaredites were the first chosen people of God. Okay, the Olmecs and the Jaredites. This is the Khmer civilization in ancient in ancient Cambodia. Okay? This is when when they led the mass exodus out of Egypt, they went through Khmer first in what's called Angkor Wat, Cambodia. Now, Cam is Kim, and again, as we spoke yesterday, they'll switch words around for purposes, I mean, switch letters around when the words are producing the same sounds for different magical and sorcerer type of effects. But guess what? And again, this is why the sun Aten is so powerful. If you're vibrating on a high level, sorcery has no effect on you whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? It only has it only has effect over those who have fear in them. Those who have love in them, do whatever sorcery you will. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It has no effect on me. And even in Africa, and this is why, in the story of the mass exodus, they say that the black people in America are the least of all black people on the planet immersed in ritualistic sacrifice. And this is why we are the most creative of all our people on the planet. Mm -hmm. This is why we have to go out and still redeem everything. Why? Because we were the ones who were part of that exodus, right? Who, who left all our brothers and sisters in Africa who wanted to overindulge in ritualistic sacrifice, overindulge in uh, 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 self-imposed limitation and projecting, and projecting themselves into into a, uh, a, a situation where something is against them or something is, or you know, like there's a fear. So when they left, when they left um, Egypt, they went through Asia, this is all documented, went through Asia and then came to Americas. The Olmec civilization and this civilization have so many similarities that it's just punching Olmec and Angkor Wat. They'll tell you that all the architecture is the same, everything is the same. In fact, one of the names that they call themselves, which definitely let them know that it was the same, is that they called themselves Nagas. Nagas, again, means the, 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 uh, the dragon people. And that's why you see dragons in a lot of the royalty emblems um, in Europe. Because uh, when the earth heats up, we will be able to contain large amounts. Only way you're going to be able to be here is to be able to commune with the sun. If you're not communing with the sun, you're not going to be able to enjoy the higher frequencies that, you know, this planet has to offer. We're living in a very low dense um, environment right now, and that's because the sustaining force is not only ignored, but the people who are in positions of power now are blocking it out because it's heating up. Why is it heating up? Because we're waking up. The dragon, the sleeping dragon is waking up again and when we wake up, we harness huge amounts of energy, the planet becomes one big tropical paradise and everybody's happy. So, that's real talk. So, um, and even right now, the climates in, in um, temperate zones are changing back to tropical. And even in New York, this is why they, the, biggest, the biggest effort right now across the globe is, to, is weather modification. The weather is on, the, the weather is changing very, very, very fast. And um, uh, that's because the planet is in an ascension state right now. You know, the indigenous people are waking up and it all relates to a 25,000 year cycle wherein we've been up for 25,000 years so we had to take a rest. We went to sleep. This is Pio Pico who was the last Mexican governor of California of African descent. He was actually a remnant of what was left of the Pichu tribe from Macho Pichu and again, they kept intermarrying and, and to the point where there was no more traces of it. He's still 
very dark black man. Um, that's his wife. The mixed race Picos were examples of the most politically powerful families of California while it was still a Mexican province. Because you got to remember, we broad stroke slavery across the whole United States. Slavery did not exist west of the Mississippi, you understand, until right before the end of slavery, maybe like 10 years. So what they were doing was moving west of the Mississippi and conquering what was left of the indigenous people who were in positions of power. Okay, California was never a slave state. Now, uh, today they are the ancestors of much of the state's old money. And even when you do your research in America, you find that all the Caucasians in positions of power and prominence married into those positions. Okay, I did a lecture on slavery where I showed that the first slaveholder in the United States was a black man named Anthony Johnson out of Virginia. He's one of the founders of Virginia. And he, um, in, eight, in 1655, he went to court to fight for the right to keep his slaves for life because prior to that, there was only indentured servitude on the books and it was only for a period of time. So he went to court to fight for the right to keep his servants for life. So this was a black man going to court to fight for the right to keep his black servants for life. And that's because whatever goes down in this dimension, you got to co-sign it. Because you are the principal. Okay, whether it's good or bad, you got to be the one to put your signature on it. Okay? Um, although few know it, this African-American figure is the person commemorated by LA's Pico Boulevard. This is an Inca temple of the sun at Cusco in Peru. And I thought I had saved the other, behind this temple, right? There's a palace that is designed in the, what they call the, um, the, Catholic, uh, the Catholic Protestant style of architecture that we see in all these castles in Europe. So what's interesting is here you have in America, pre-Columbus, an Islamic temple called the Temple of the Sun annexed to a castle and a palace. When you, you know, if you get a chance, just Google Temple of the Sun, uh, Inca Temple of the Sun, and you'll see the other side of this temple, which is actually a Romanesque palace. Because again, the Roman Empire started out of Central America. We just never knew it. And the Roman Empire is the same indigenous black people who established themselves right here in Bavaria. Again, the sun is key in nobility. And this is a perfect example of an Islamic temple annexed to a Catholic and Protestant palace. So when you get a chance, just look at the Catholic and Protestant palace and you'll say, wow, this was built before Columbus got to America? It looks just like any of the um, palaces throughout Europe right now. As well as this looks just like the Alhambra palace in Spain. Hello. Hello. Y'all deep today, huh? It's a girl's night out. What's going on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, um, this is called the Eastern Elevation. This is inside that temple. And again, if you know anything about any Moorish architecture, you know that's all throughout Spain and... Let's just make sure they're okay. It's a party upstairs. <laughs> Okay, the Jaredite people of the Book of Mormon or the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. The Jaredites were a people whose history is given in the Book of Mormon, an ancient record kept by the people of the Americas and then later translated by the prophet. You notice once he found it, he, he knew he was a prophet once he found them tablets. The Jaredites were descendants of Jared, his brother, 
and other righteous people of their family. They were led to the Americas by God at the time of the Tower of Babel. Their history is found in the Book of Ether and the Book of Mormon. Following is a short chronology of their history. The civilization existed roughly between 2700 BC and 600 BC. In the chart there are some gaps because no information is given in the Book of Mormon about that time. Or maybe he wanted to conveniently remove certain things. You never know. But this uh, chronology is the same chronology that the uh, Washita Moors use. They say that they arrived about 3000 BC. What's interesting here in the book of uh, Ether, in the second chapter, second verse, uh, when they're talking about their trip over here from Egypt, uh, they make special mention of a most important passenger named Deseret. Uh, Deseret in Egypt means the bee. And the bee was very special in Egypt. And of course, they brought the bee back to America with them. Okay, now it is a remarkable coincidence that the word Deseret, or something very close to it, because of course we didn't use vowels, enjoyed a position of ritual prominence among the founders of the classical Egyptian civilization who associated it very closely with the symbol of the bee. Chief among their co-objects would seem to be the bee, for the land they first settled in Egypt was forever after known as the land of the bee and was designated in hieroglyphic by the picture of the bee. While every king of Egypt in his capacity of king of upper and lower Egypt bore the title, he who belongs to the sedge and the bee. This is a, um, some illustrations which demonstrate the affinity between the Olmec writing and Mandi writing of North Africa as well as Celtic writing of Ireland. And they are the same things. I mean, there's very little variation, if any. <coughs> and this is uh, uh, the Mandi writing, the Berber writing of North uh, Africa, and the Celtic writing as well. Identical to the writing in Zabata, or what we would say, Sab Sabata. Saba, meaning seven. Seven, or oath. Right. Okay, now we're going to go into Kalalus, a Jewish Catholic state in early America. <laughs> and we're going to find a lot of Kabbalistical artifacts in this site. Okay, as well as, this is pretty much just like Joseph Smith who found those tablets and deciphered them. Well, in 1925, a man found these out west in the Midwest and they called in a lot of, a lot of top archaeologists and professors and um, researchers and they even had the uh, head of the Smithsonian Institute come out. And one of the good things is they didn't act like they lost all of this stuff after a while, which they did when they found the pyramids and the temples in the um, Grand Canyon in 1909 as front page articles about the Smithsonian and them coming to the Grand Canyon to um, to basically evaluate this ancient Egyptian artifacts and then months later there's no record of them and no more history of them. This was found in 1925 and even though it hasn't been a lot of uh, mention of it there's still extensive information and research that you can find on Kalalus. Sure. So you need another take? You can, do your, you can do your research. There's parts of the Grand Canyon that are now have been cut off since 1909 to public access. But in these parts of the Grand Canyon, there are um, uh, areas called the Temple of Horus, the Temple of uh, 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 Orset, the Temple of um, you know, Isis, and so forth and so on. In the Grand Canyon. In the Grand Canyon, yeah. We are, we are Egyptians. You are an Egyptian. You're an Egyptian. You're an Egyptian. She's an Egyptian. Egyptians. Okay? Really, Kemetians. Because Kemet means land of the black. There you go. Kalalus, a Jewish Catholic state in early medieval America. 
In the 1920s in Tucson, Arizona, were found objects and writings in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, with both Catholic and Jewish ritual objects and symbols. Three, four, five, six, seven. Seven girls. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the 1920s in Tucson, Arizona, were found objects and writings in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew with both Catholic and Jewish ritual objects and symbols. Cyclone Covey describes this discovery in his book, Colonus, a Roman Jewish colony in America, from Charlemagne to Covey and researchers are amazed at the mixture of Jewish, Christian, and Kabbalistic objects and symbols. However, this very much fits this period in the 8th century when in the Carolingian Empire there was a Jewish principality in southern France called Septimania ruled by Theodoric Narbonne. Now he actually is one of the Olmecs, Theodoric Narbonne. Born in 1710, died in 1765, many members of his family descended from the exilarchs of Babylon, embraced a Jewish form of Catholicism, while other members remained outwardly Orthodox Jews. See, what you gotta realize is that all of the nobility here were calling themselves Jews, but they were practicing Catholicism, you know, and they were using Kabbalah. Okay, these are some of the artifacts found there. The dagger on the left, a lot of spears and, and stuff, and this is another, see it Lord, they got the little Kabbalistic symbols and all that on there. I'm okay, not sure I'm oh, I'm sorry baby. <laughs> get all that, get that, that's good money. New York Times, December 13th, 1925. Puzzling relics dug up in Arizona desert stir scientists. Story commences in 1775 AD with three people being carried forth over the sea to Roman Kalalus, an unknown land. Here they found a people whom they called the Totexes. What did that sound like? The Toltecs. The scientists agreeing that the people they found were the Toltec Indians. At this period, Theodorus was the ruler of these European adventurers and was a brave fighter and a man of courage. He carried on much warfare with the Toltecs and after ruling for a period of 14 years, he was succeeded by uh, Jacobus. Now, um, I don't know why, uh, it, in, in, in this part of the article, this is like, um, in this part of the article, um, in this part of the article, the story commences in 1775, I mean, seven, seven, 775 A.D., but in all actuality, they left Kalalus and went to Europe first and then came back in 775 A.D. They left America in the second century. Okay, we're going to read that further down in the same article. But it's a little confusing um, from that point. The investigation and excavating is only in the embryo stage and is to be carried on to completion in the future. However, much definite information has been brought to light that establishes these relics as being several hundred uh, years pre-Columbian. Dean Byron Cummings, curator of the State Museum, Archaeologist and member of the faculty of the University of Arizona, who has also investigated this problem, is convinced as to the antiquity of the finds and as to the articles being genuine. He establishes the age of the relics through the Roman script contained upon them, which he states has not been in common use since the 8th century, and through archaeological and geological evidence. And this he is supported by Professor Frank H. Fowler, who has translated all of the Latin inscriptions on the piece found to date. Kalalus, a Roman Jewish colony uh, by Cyclone Covey. We spoke about him, uh, he, he wrote a book on it. In 
775 AD, Nehemiah Theodoric reconquered, see, the American empire of Kalalus. Kalalus was ruled by the Sylvanus Toltexus. This is more, and this is actually detailed accounts, more detailed accounts of the Joseph Smith information. Um, come on, darling. Um, so, this is just more detailed information about the Joseph Smith information and about the ancient indigenous people of America being the same people who came over here and established the Roman Empire over here in Bavaria. They actually was a satellite and were the remnants of what was taking place when they was fighting amongst themselves and killing themselves off. Okay? Um, Kalalus was ruled by Silvanus Toltecus. Silvanus, because a lot of times, what I like about over here is that when you buy something, sometimes it might be three meanings, three words for one thing. I noticed that on a few things I bought out here. Um, I don't know if that's on a lot of different things that you buy, but it might say three, a word slash another word slash another word, and it'll give you, huh? The languages. Yeah, the languages. different languages, but it, it, it also shows you how they all relate. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Or the same thing can be said in a different language. Mm -hmm. So here, like for example, Solomon the Builder is Sylvanus to Texas. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So, the Toltecs were Hebrew, just like um, Joseph Smith been saying all along. He found stuff that a lot of people would think sounds too, you know, fanciful. But here we have another confirmation that's not coming from a religious set, okay? And it was unearthed after the fact. So still in the United States, we see that there are still more relics that have been found, and I'm sure there are going to be more that's found. Okay, Kalalus was founded in the first century, there we go, by the Babylonian exilarch known as Sylvanus Ogam or Sylvanus Brabo, Solomon II, Babylonian exilarch. Nazi of Mara, see the word Nazi? Right? Ruler of Summer, Somerset in Britain. A great Roman Jewish ruler, soldier, and ancestor of the Swan Knights. The Swan Knights was another name for the boats that they was coming across here because they was built like swans. They had a swan, you know how the swan tail come up and curve? Gotcha. And they would be moving in the swan boats. All right? But they said that the swan boats were built by um, the descendants of the Omex or the Toltecs. You know, because these are just different names. Because in, in uh, Joseph Smith's story, the Jaredites, right, are the Toltecs fighting against the Aztecs. Mm. That's all they, they, they you know, they, they'll tell you, yeah, the Toltecs and the Aztecs are the descendants of Egyptians who migrated over here during the Exodus. They stopped in Asia, they came here, then they started fighting amongst each other, and only a few of them survived, and they migrated north and left their. The, you know, the history and the tablets. So, uh, he also had a fleet of trading vessels known as the ships of Solomon or the swan boats. The ships are shaped like a swan with its sails like the wings of a beautiful gliding white swan. After the defeat of the Sylvanus Toe, Texas, the members of the royal family were sent back to Europe where they were under the protection of Nehemiah Theodorus and his family the legends of Dune and Ogier are based on the activities of this family descended from Duan, Antagon, Ogier. This is another name for the Omex, by the way. And Sylvanus Brabo, Solomon Barber, or like the Berber. Dr. Neil Judd, I just threw these people in because I wanted you to see that there were notable people evaluating these sites and affirming their authenticity. Dr. Neil Judd of the Smithsonian Institute visited the excavation and completely excavated two of the articles himself. He stated that the articles were very old and that there was absolutely no evidence of disturbance of the earth surrounding them. He reached this conclusion after chopping these two pieces loose with a miner's pick. All of these men have either excavated these finds themselves. He's just going into the fact that there was no tampering and he's 
validating the authenticity. Okay. Okay. Um, this is a, a scripture from one of the tablets. January 1st, 900 AD. We are carried forth over the sea to Kalalus, an unknown Kalalus, an unknown land to a people ruling widely, the Toltecs. Sylvanus, who was Solomon the Builder, were led over. Theodorus brings up his forces at the city Rhoda, and more than 700 are captured. No gold shall be taken from the city. Theodorus, a man of great courage, rules 14 years. James rules six years. With God help, with God's help, nothing need be feared. In the name of Israel, signed O. L. Israel III went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico and his grandson, Makir Amarek, uh, the grandfather of Tapiltzin, priest of Quaxicotl, who left Chula for Rhoda in around 1000 AD. Now, Rhoda, I think Rhoda is Rhode Island. The reason I say I think Rhoda is Rhode Island is because he said that they went eastward to Rhoda and then went to Europe. And when you, when you start to, well, then when they get into King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, they're going to talk about the St. John's Indians, right? And St. John's just happens to be right next, to, right next door to Rhode Island. Rhode Island is where the only castles Rhode Island is where the only castles that are um, pre-Columbian that are still really, really in great condition are at. And most of the, uh, the, the so-called aristocracy or the people in positions of power, like the Vanderbilts, who we now know were descendants of Van Sally, the black settler of Brooklyn. How many people knew that a black Muslim settled Brooklyn? The first settler of Brooklyn is a black Muslim named John Van Sally, who was the admiral of the Moroccan Navy. But this is later. This is in the 1600s when he settles oh, okay. uh, uh, Brooklyn. But there's still, you know, our history is still intact to a certain degree at that time. There's still a lot of um, uh, original people doing big things. Now, okay, uh, let's see. Settled in northwestern Spain, okay, from the road who let, see? The remnant of the Rodans, Rhoda means red, by the way, and you know red is very prominent with all of the nobility, who he led east and then back to Europe, and some of the Latin Jewish Rodans settled in northwest Spain, where as trained warriors, they were welcome to fight to preserve the freedom of northwestern Spain from the Muslims. Rodrigo El Cid, was Topitzin's great grandson. Uh, Topitzin's son was called Lane Calvo or Lancelin. Rodrigo El Cid and his father Diego Lanes married into the Davidic Exilarch family of Barcelona and Este. His daughter Maria Rodriguez was the wife of Raymond Berenger, fourth Arnold Count of Barcelona, descended in a direct male line from uh, Gebelin of Nabron, the youngest son of Makir Sept of Septimania. Lane Calvo Sixta Zemina of Calalus married Ferdinand Nunez of the Counts of Amaya family. Some genealogists confuse the ancestors of this family uh, with the family of El Cid. Okay, um, again the Swan Knights were uh, Olmecs who traveled because when you ever you see Silvanus Ogam and these his this the guy who wrote the book said he corresponded and found the names that correspond to the information he found in America with records that he had in Europe. And he said that Ogam can only mean Omec. You know? His son uh Iliud Hababa was the father of Sylvanus Tomei, ruler of Atala, America, and the lord and master of uh, Anahuk, 
or Mexico, Calaluz. Now, um, Atala is an abbreviation because another name for America is Patala, which I went into before. Now, when you, when you take the name Patala, that's when you can find all of the information connecting Angkor Wat or Cambodia to America because they say they come from Patala. Or they say that their family is in Patala. They, or, you know. So Patala is an ancient name for the continent of America. When you study Chinese um, history, you find that Quan Yin said she came from Patala. You know? And as well as a lot of their uh, you know, ancient deities or, or people, the stories go that they came from Patala, which is an ancient name of America. Madame Blavatsky speaks about the name America being Patala a lot in her uh, theosophical literature. King Arthur, Knights of the Round Table. In the fifth century, Kalalus was part of the revived Western Empire of King Arthur, a descendant of the Swan Knights. By the eighth century, due to admixture with the American Indians, who were the St. John's Indians. If you have time, do research on the St. John's Indians, and you'll find that they were part of King Arthur's uh, army. And, and, you know, they was moving with him. Okay, by the eighth century, due to admixture with the American Indians, these were just different black people. It's like, if, if you join the Hebrew Israelites, and you join the Nation of Guards and Nerfs, and you join the FOI, do that make us not one family? It's just niggas of a different name, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, you might call yourself that. Now, I'm sorry for the term, uh, some, some people might not be used to the term nigga, um, but it's, it's, just an, it's just a variation of Naga, and if we understand what Naga means, we know that, okay, okay, I'm just making sure, I just wanna make sure. Okay, um, and have reverted to paganism. So again, we had some of us who was getting caught up in ritualistic sacrifice. Nehemiah Theodorus led an expedition in 775 to return Kalalus to Jewish and Roman rule. So again, by that time, they was coming back, right? He conquered the ancient city of Rhoda because when he came back, that's what's the first thing if you're going to hit if you're coming from Europe to the Americas, Rhode Island. Ancient city of Rhoda, and again, do your research. It's palaces all over Rhode Island. That's pre-Columbus. And even the Caucasians that's in there claim descendancy of black people anyway. So after four years in 779, Nehemiah Theodorus left Kalalus for his kingdom in France, which he had left in the hands of his brother, Guillaume de Galon. Um, killed in the Battle of Carcassonne. He then appointed a British Davidic prince, Jacob, as the Jewish king of Kalalus as regent for his young son Israel, who was married to Jacob's daughter. Jacob was a descendant of King Arthur as well as the Jewish royal family of Bernica. Jacob was the leader of the British Jewish settlers in Kalalus. The Roman Jewish settlers in Kalalus in the eighth century were made up of two main groups the Latin Jewish group from the Frankish Empire and the British Jewish group from the British Isles. Ten? Okay, I'm almost done anyway. Okay, um... Uh, Makeri and, and Iri, you see Iri at the end of their names, Lord. This means, this means lion, by the way, in Hebrew, right? Yep, Iri. Right, so that's like saying the, 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 the lion Mac. Sun. <laughs> That's another way of saying the sun. The, the sun too, right? Um, in, uh, he reigned in Germany until his death. Again, he was from, we know where he was, he was, he was reigning over here, and he was coming from Rodan. He was a Rodan from Rhode Island. When they say how period means of the period, so that might be a place he was from too. Or of the lion, of the lineage, right? right? Of the royal lineage. Um, the Makiri, the mm -hmm. M, mm -hmm. it's from, the K means my, and the Eri could be from my line. From the sun. They all said that they were direct lineage of the sun. Just like, just like I say, I'm direct lineage of the sun. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
He learned about the land of Kalidus from Gerard, a member of the Swan Knight family. He was one of Charlemagne's leading advisors. Remember, Charlemagne was, was the first one that took the Roman Republic dictators to court for claiming descendancy to uh, German nobility, for perpetrating a fraud like they was an empire when it was really an out of control nation state. So Charlemagne reserved the right of nobility for the indigenous people again because he was indigenous and he was aboriginal. Okay, the Swan Knights ancestors had come to Ireland from Kalaloos in the second and third centuries AD. That's way before that. Um, and intermarried with the descendants of Nathan the Red. Remember, Red is very prominent with the indigenous uh, family because that's the, that's the color, that's, that's like the sun flaring, right? A grandson of Mar Joseph of Arimathea. Mar Joseph was a grandson of Sylvanus Ogam or Brabo. Again, these words you got to start to realize that they see how they'll put Sylvanus and say that Sylvanus is Solomon, Shalom, Sulam, Salem, Silvus, Silvius, Salvo. All the same person who brought it from America to Europe. Okay, Ogam or or Og Ham or OG Ham, the OG Ham, <laughs> right? Look at synchronicity. The OG Ham is the legendary home of the, and I believe that they refer to the Olmec culture of Mexico. Okay, so the indigenous sovereigns that was from right here in Bavaria came from back home. This is an interesting aspect of the finds. They found dinosaurs on the sword that they found at Kalaloos. They found a dinosaur inscribed in the sword, and they compared it with the dinosaurs that they found inscribed at Angkor Wat and said, these are roughly around the same time, and they're in the modern era. So this threw off their whole the thing with the dinosaurs. Another reason that academics are so keen to dismiss these discoveries is they provide evidence that some dinosaurs lived in historic times as one of the swords discovered has a, dip, a Diplodocus dinosaur on it. The ruins of Angkor Wat in Asia also demonstrate that 800 years ago the builders of Angkor Wat knew what a uh, Stegosaurus looked like long before the modern day discovery of dinosaur artifacts. These artifacts are embarrassing to those who follow an evolutionary dating of the age of the dinosaurs. It is a lot harder to dismiss the Stegosaurus on Angkor Wat than it is the Diplodocus on the Kalaloos sword. The Diplodocus skeletons are interestingly found in the northwestern part of North America. Okay. Um, the British Jewish Rodan settled in Wales. In the 12th century, their descendants in Wales went with Prince uh, Modoc to America, whereby they established themselves in a series of forts in Alabama and Georgia. The Alabama Welsh website states in regards to Prince Modoc, in 1170, 10 small ships assembled off Lundy Island in the Bristol Channel, which flows beneath between South Wales and Southern England. He and his 10 ships were never heard from again. It was many years later when the archeological discovery of European style structures in the Southeast built centuries before Columbus's journey prompted a review of the Welsh history of Modoc's voyage. A series of pre-Columbian dressed stone fortifications built up the Alabama River were discovered by later settlers Three major forts, completely unlike any known Indian structures, not no little teepees, were constructed along the route that settlers arrived in Mobile Way, Bay uh, would have taken. The first fort erected on top of Lookout Mountain near DeSoto Falls, Alabama, was found to be nearly identical in setting, layout, and method of construction to Dalway Dunn Castle in Gwynedd, the presumed birthplace of the Modoc of Wales. It is said that, then they go here, a white tribe of Indians, which, you know, we ain't gonna go there. We're gonna leave that alone for now. Okay, we're gonna just get into a little translation of the crosses and wrap this up. Uh, on, the cross, on the cross arm at the left is a profile of a head with the words Britain, Albion, and Jacob. 
In the center is another head profile with the words Roman, Actum, and Theodore. On the right is another head profile with the words Gaul, Seen, and Israel. On the vertical beam of the lead cross is this inscription. Councils of great cities together with 700 soldiers, 800 AD, January 1st. We are born over the sea to Calalus, an unknown land where Totexas Sylvanus ruled far and wide over a people. Theodore transferred his troops to the foot of the city Rhoda, and more than 700 were captured. No goal is taken away. Theodore, a man of great courage, rules for, seven, for 14 years. Jacob rules for six. With the help of God, nothing has to be feared in the name of Israel. O.L. Signed, O.L. 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 Cipher of God. Done it again. The second cross has the following inscription. Jacob renews the city. With God's help, Jacob rules with mighty hand in the manner of his ancestors. Sing to the Lord. May his flame live forever. Third cross yielded the inscription from the egg, the beginning, 700 A.D. to 900, nothing but the cross. While the war was raging, Israel died. Pray for the soul of Israel. May the earth lie light on thee. He adds glory to ancestral glory. Israel, defender of the faith. Israel reigns 67 years. Okay. Um, this is what I was saying when when you when you study the um, when you study um, Joseph Smith and the Mormons, and then you look at um, the tablets that they found pertaining to Kalalus, they both are, it's too many parallels. It's like it, he probably found some of the same tablets. And they fought so much that this is an example of what I told you earlier. The next inscription, right, for uh, Israel III for liberating the Toltecs, Texas was banished. They had just attacked them and desecrated them. The next, uh, that was the, um, the second. The third liberated the same people that they were fighting because what? They are the same people under different names. It's like, it's like the, um, the Nation of Islam fighting with the whomever. It's the same people and, and one day it may take a child to go, I'm not fighting him. He, that's my brother right there. That's ridiculous. Okay? And this is a, a culmination of the history from that 700 to the 900 year period. But remember, this is at the final stage when they had been desecrated. Okay? From the beginning, nothing but the cross by suffering. Israel died in the war. Pray for the soul of Israel. May God be with us. Uh, as with our ancestors, may the earth be light unto thee. Israel, defender of the faith, adds honor to our ancestral honor. Israel reigned 67 years. Israel reigned, the second reigned six years. Israel, the, the second started to reign when 26 years old. Notice, they didn't even put Israel the third in this one. I guess he was, you know, he had abandoned their, you know, history of war with their people that look just like them, so they erased him off of their, um, off of their list, pretty much like they did Akhenaten. Akhenaten is not inside any of the lists of the pharaohs because he was the only one that abandoned all of that ritualistic sacrifice. They just put him off the list. So they're praying for the same faith, but they just showed you that some of them were more interested in fighting then peace. A war of uh, Israel started to reign when 26 years old. A war of extermination, either to conquer or to die. That's ridiculous. Feel me? He flourished in his ancestral honor from day to day. Prepare for either event, but hope is not yet crushed. By the grace of God, time having elapsed, from adversity comes the source and origin of our miseries. The last day comes and the inevitable time. I am present, the Lord be with you, O-L. Okay? The return of the Son of Man, everybody's waiting for the Son of Man to come back. That's the Son of Man right there. You know what I'm saying? Um, that's the Son of Man. That's the Son of Man. That's the Son of Man. All of us are the Son of Man. That's the Son of Man. That's the Son of Man. 
We are all waiting for ourselves to come, basically. Because the sun means the soul. And the soul is your immortal aspect of yourself that's bigger than this little experience you're having right now. That part of you that knows everything that could be known, past, present, and future. That part of you that's in tune with everything. Okay, the primordial sun is the pineal gland. In, in, in Genesis it says that, or was that Exodus? That J Jacob wrestled with the sun, that's Exodus. And he wrestled with the angel and then saw the face of God on Mount Pineal. Because you got to remember, Atun's symbol was the winged disc. This is the winged disc. This is how you fly, your pineal gland. And also walk between worlds. Ra, the original winged disc of Atun. The awakening of the original people to the knowledge of self is the return of the Son of Man. Okay? As a summary, we know that in ancient Egypt, and we could go back deeper into Atlantis and Lemuria, but we'll save that because a lot of times, even when with um, a lot of people don't like to get that. That's that's that might be a little bit a lot for certain people. They got to first get this kind of information and take it one step at a time. But as a summary of this uh, part of the lecture, we we examine ancient Egypt. And how they started out with Ra as their primordial creator, principle, as a complete one. And then as they began to um, expand on the story, they ended up polarizing themselves into the abyss and staying there. Okay? Moses and the Exodus to the Americas. There's tremendous information showing that there's correspondences between Moses and Akhenaten and the return to the oneness of the creator principle and the abandoning of fragmental ways of thinking. Also, a correspondence with the fact that the so-called black people in America, who are the most creative of our people on the planet, are only the most creative because they are not caught up in ritualistic sacrifice. The Olmec civilization and the Mormons, the Jaredites, we know that these are the same, that the Mormons and the uh, Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, take their history from the Olmec history, which is this history, as well as the Washita history. And that Kalalus was the, um, the satellite before it went over here to Bavaria. And now we know that the cipher is complete because we're back to Aquarius, which is the ecliptic of the horizon of the whole zodiac sign. But we must not forget the pole star, which is also shifting. So now we have we're entering a new age while the pole star is changing from the wolf to the Ethiopian king. So we have the Aquarius, which is the, really was Nut. It used to be Nut in ancient Egypt, which was a feminine principle. And it was embodied by a woman. So now we have the woman in her glory with the king on, at the pole star. So now we have the unification.